Hey there. Let's review where we're at in the UX design process. You've learned how to empathize with users, define user needs and problem statements, and come up with ideas for design solutions. You've also created a wireframe and made your way into the prototype phase. Now you're going to learn how to conduct research to test your prototype. Once you have your research findings, you'll use the insights to iterate on and improve your low fidelity designs. By the end of this course, you'll know how to plan a research study, conduct research with a usability study, analyze and synthesize research results, share and promote research insights, and modify designs based on research insights. But before we get started, let me tell you a bit about myself. My name is Jason, and I'm a UX researcher and UX manager at Google. During my career here, I've worked on products like Google Chrome. I'm currently leading a team called Equity Engineering. Our team practices equity-focused design, and we work to make sure that Google's products, systems, and processes are fair and equitable for both Googlers and our users. I advocate for folks that are underrepresented and for groups that have been historically excluded from design. Focusing on equity in your design can be a powerful tool to help you effectively meet the needs of your users. Early in my career, I held many different jobs that were not in UX design. My journey into UX design has not been the most straightforward, but it has been fulfilling. Your career journey will be a unique one as well. I'm excited to guide you through your next course in UX design, which is all about conducting research and testing prototypes. To get started, we'll go through the four steps in a UX research study. Then we'll deep dive into the first step, planning a study, which has seven elements. Ready to get started? Let's do it. I head up a team. We have a product lead. We have a, a business systems analyst, UX engineer, UX designer. Uh, UX researchers as well. And what we do is we define this as, as equity-focused research. So what this consists of is trying to, to speak with users from these underrepresented and sometimes marginalized groups to understand basically their experiences and their needs. So I grew up in, in Oakland here in California. I come from a lower socioeconomic status background. I understand like what my folks had to do uh, to, to get a degree of social capital and resources to be able to, to give us a, a reasonable quality of life. But I think of kind of the struggles my folks had, the struggles being a black man, the struggles uh, that I've gone through in terms of, of access to resources, access to education, uh, uh, straight on kind of discrimination because of the color of my skin and my background as well. Having that lived experience I realized like, I wanna be able to advocate for people that are from my background and my community, but there are tons of other backgrounds and communities um, that are struggling in that same way. I think that's what kind of drives me to do the work is that lived experience and understanding that there are people in need. So I studied medicine at, at UCSF um, and I did my clinical rotations at SF General Hospital. As you transition from the, the preclinical years to the clinical years, these are the moments in which you're actually talking to people. Um, and SF General being a county hospital, um, it was the first time essentially that I got to start to work with people that were from my own community. So I was working with a number of black folks that were from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds. Um, and there were patients there that were going through really, really horrible, horrible things. So I would sit down and I would talk to people sometimes for 45 minutes or an hour to kind of understand like what their backgrounds were and, and what their needs were, at least in the clinical space. And it was kind of those moments of understanding their needs and understanding kind of where the system had broken down for them, right? Uh, that I think I, I learned the most and I could see the points at which these patients, physicians, were missing the mark. They weren't getting the information that was necessary to help these people. And so a lot of that is why I left the field of medicine, because I wanted to do something that would be scalable and had a lot more to do with uh, education and access for folks that had not had it up till that point. I actually left UCSF early before finishing. I got three out of four years in, and I went to Stanford instead. And I uh, got into a doctoral program there in learning sciences and technology design. I got exposed to UX in general, uh, product design, and UX research. 
And while I did my, my doctoral work, I was focused on uh, understanding the experience of uh, black plus students at historically black colleges and universities, these students that were pursuing degrees in computer science and electrical engineering. My work there was focused on understanding the challenges there and understanding kind of their ideas of uh, their own identity as engineers. So I went through the doctoral program and got into um, an internship here at Google. I had a chance to then be able to convert to a full-time position after the internship and I landed on a wonderful team, a Chrome UX team. I came onto that team to kind of get my chops, right? Like to understand what UXR really meant and to understand how to work in product design, right? Uh, but at the same time, when I came in the door, my intention was to be able to do equity work. Since kind of hitting the ground, I've been in uh, programs and created my own programs that have focused on um, equitable access to education and specifically equitable access to education in UX. I think my favorite part uh, about my job is uh, the ability to focus on equity. And I think for me, what that means is being able to advocate for groups that are underrepresented and marginalized and groups that don't have um, as much agency or kind of access to a voice in the industry. So being able to uh, speak with folks from these backgrounds and elevate their voices and elevate their needs is, is kind of the thing that, that keeps me going through the job day by day. I'm Jason and I am the head of equity engineering at Google. Hi again. In this video, you'll learn about a process for conducting UX research called a research study. In a UX context, a research study is a step-by-step -step examination of a group of users and their needs which adds realistic context to the design process. UX researchers adopt various methods to uncover problems and design opportunities. In doing so, they reveal valuable information which can be fed into the design process. The term research study is often shortened to study. There are four steps in a UX research study. We'll cover each step in more depth throughout the course. In this video, we'll simply set up the steps. To get started, step one is plan the study. Step two, conduct the research. Step three, analyze and synthesize the results. And step four, share and promote the insights. For now, here's a little introduction to each. The first step is to plan the study. To plan a study, start by outlining the background for the project. Next, set goals for your research and write down the questions you wanna answer. Then establish the steps you'll take to conduct the study and select the people who will participate in the study. The work you do while planning the research study is incredibly important since it impacts every other part of your research. You need a proper plan to get successful research results. The second step is to conduct the research. During this step, you'll gather data. There are several techniques you can use, but the one we'll focus on in this course is called a usability study. A usability study is a research method that assesses how easy it is for users to complete core tasks in a design. The goal of a usability study is to identify pain points that the user experiences with your designs, so the issues can be fixed before the final product launches. During a usability study, you get a chance to see how users interact with your new product or feature. You can also interview users to learn more about their experience. The third step is to analyze and synthesize your results. This involves trying to find the actual meaning in the data. You want to figure out why the data is the way it is. Look for patterns in the quantitative data and explore trends in the qualitative data from participants' answers to interview questions. The last step is to share and promote your insights with the project's stakeholders. Project stakeholders are people who are involved in the project or who will be impacted by its results. Project stakeholders need the results of your research and need to agree with the direction of the project. For example, your project stakeholders might include other designers, the head of your department, or the engineers who will help bring your design to life. To share and promote your insights, you need to create a presentation. Your presentation should include the method you use to conduct your research, the data you collected, the conclusions you reached based on that data, 
and your recommendations for acting on those conclusions. The stronger the connection between your research conclusions and your recommendations, the more likely it is that your stakeholders will take the actions you've proposed. So why is conducting a UX research study important? Remember, the goal of user experience research is to prioritize the user. A UX research study helps us gain an understanding of users' problems in order to solve them. It can also help bridge the gap between what a business thinks the user needs and what the user actually needs before an expensive and time-consuming product is made. Okay, we've now defined the four steps in UX research study. Plan the study, conduct the research, analyze and synthesize the results, and share and promote the insights. In the next video, we'll begin our journey through the steps of the UX research study. We'll start by discussing the elements of a research plan. See you there. Ready to start our journey through a UX research study? Let's explore the first step, planning the study. Like any good explorer, you need to have a plan for where you're headed. There are seven elements that your plan should include. The project background, the research goals, the detailed research questions, the key performance indicators or KPIs, the methodology, the participants, and the script or questions you'll ask participants. Let's break them down. The first element of your plan is the project background. The project background answers the question, what led you to conduct this research? You don't have to provide a long, drawn-out history. Just a few lines is good. You might explain the project background like this. We're creating a new app to help people find and schedule dog walkers. We need to find out if the main user experience, finding and scheduling a dog walker, is easy for users to complete. Next, your plan should include research goals. Ask yourself questions like, what design problems are you trying to solve and how will the results of the research impact our design decisions? Use your answers to create goals for your research project. In our example, one research goal might be, determine if the dog walker app is difficult to use. We need to consider the ease of use in order to understand why customers join our app and leave or stay. After you determine research goals, you need to develop detailed research questions for your plan. What are the questions your research is trying to answer? For example, our research questions might be, how long does it take a user to find and book a dog walker in the app? And what can we learn from the user flow or the steps that users take to book a dog walker? Another important element of your plan is the key performance indicators or KPIs. As a reminder, key performance indicators are critical measures of progress towards an end goal. You might ask, how can you measure your progress towards the research goal? For our app, one thing we should track is how many users in the research study complete their search for a dog walker. So the KPI would be the percentage of users who book a dog walker. The next element of your plan is the methodology. This is where you document the steps you'll take to conduct your research. How will you collect data? And how will you analyze the data once you get it? To find out if users are able to find and schedule a dog walker in our new app, we might want to conduct a survey of prospective users. To analyze the survey results, we will use a spreadsheet and identify trends. In addition, your research plan lists the research participants. Who will you survey? What characteristics do the participants have? For example, you might want to recruit participants who are dog owners with full-time jobs and who go out for activities more than once a week. The types of participants you select should be based on your research goals. Also, make sure the participants you select do not bias your results. To show you what I mean, let me tell you a true story. In the 1936 United States presidential election, Republican Alf Landon challenged the Democratic incumbent, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The Literary Digest, one of the most respected magazines of the era, conducted a poll of 2.4 million people to predict who would win the election. With that large of a sample size, you'd think their results would be pretty reliable, right? You'd be wrong. The Literary Digest predicted Landon would beat Roosevelt, with Landon taking 57% of the vote and Roosevelt taking 43%. But on election day, Roosevelt scored a decisive win. Landon gathered only 38% of the vote and Roosevelt took 62%. 
So why was the Literary Digest prediction so inaccurate? The problem was something called sample bias. The Literary Digest selected its participants from contact info they found in car registrations and telephone directories. Can you spot the problem? Let's break it down. The majority of people who owned cars and telephones in 1936 were wealthy. And at that time, many wealthy people tended to vote Republican. That means that the sampling was biased in favor of Republicans. So the prediction that Republican Alf Landon would win reflected that sample bias. So what does this teach us? When conducting research, we need to choose study participants who are representative of all our users, not just a select group. You'll learn more about different types of biases later on. The final step in your research plan is to script the questions you ask study participants as they test your product. The script is also known as the discussion guide. Make sure these questions are specific and speak to the KPIs you're trying to measure. For instance, you could ask, did you face any challenges when trying to book a dog walker in the app? Now, you know the seven elements of a research plan. Coming up, we'll continue our journey and dive into each of the seven elements in more detail. We'll start by focusing on the first three elements, project background, research goals, and research questions. Let's cruise on over. Hi again. We now know the seven elements of a research plan. Let's discuss a few of them in more detail. The project background, research goals, and research questions. These elements shape the rest of your research study, so developing them is really important. Let's start by examining the project background of a research plan. This element summarizes the situation leading to the needs for this research. It's a brief explanation you can give to anyone who asks why you're doing this research. Why is the project background an important part of your research plan? Establishing a project background gets the team on the same page at the beginning of the study. Everyone on the team needs to have a common grasp of the history leading up to the current situation. Think of it this way. Your team needs to agree on why you're doing the research before you start the study. A clear project background also shows you understand why you're doing this research and promotes confidence in the overall quality of your analysis and insights. The value of this might not be apparent when you're planning your study, but it will be when you present your research to people who have the power to act on your recommendations. Now that you know why the project background is an important part of a research plan, you're ready to create your own. Keep these three things in mind as you write the project background. Identify the signals that indicated research was necessary. Ask yourself why you're doing this research and if there's a problem you're trying to solve. Describe any previous research that has been conducted or solutions that have been tried. How have previous attempts brought us closer to solving the problem? Lastly, list insights the research will generate. An insight is an observation about people that helps you understand the user or their needs from a new perspective. A great insight inspires clear action and uses simple language. In the project background, include how the insights will be used and what decisions will be made based on those insights. There might be a lot of information, but keep the project background concise so that everyone on your team will read it. Now. Let's move on to the second element of a research plan, research goals. This element might also be called research objectives. Research goals state the specific ideas that you want to learn from the research or what you would like the outcomes of the research to be. Research goals help you understand what is the bigger picture of doing this research. And that's why identifying your research goals is so important. Essentially, they drive the entire study. So how do you develop research goals? Let's break it down. The goals of your research will differ from project to project. They will fit into one of three categories depending on when, during the product life cycle, you run your research. If you run research before you start the design process, your research goal should help you understand why or if you should build the product. As a reminder, research at this time is called foundational research, and the goals of the research are to better understand the user problem you're trying to solve. You want to make sure that there is a real need for the product. For our dog walking app, the goal of foundational research would be to understand if there is a need for a dog walking app. 
If you run research during the design phase, your goal should help you understand how to build the product. Research at this time is called design research, and it will give you the answers you need to move forward through the design process with confidence. In our example, the goal of design research would be to learn how you should build the dog walking app and what features it will need in order to solve the user's problem. Finally, if you run research on a product after it has been launched, your research goals help you understand if the product worked as expected. This type of research is called post-launch research, and the goals reflect whether you have successfully completed what you set out to do. The post-launch research goal for our dog walking app could be to understand if the app we designed attracts and retains regular users. Okay, so now you've got the hang of the project background and research goals. Next, let's think about the third element of a research plan, research questions. To put it simply, research questions are the handful of questions you plan to answer during the study. These should not be the literal questions you plan to ask study participants. We'll go over these later when we start creating our interview script. Instead, the research questions should be the questions you want your research to answer and should align with the goals of your research. So why are research questions important? They guide your research. Research questions provide focus and structure for your research study. In addition, research questions will be the main topics you cover in your presentation. A few quick tips for writing research questions. A good research question should be actionable. You should be able to identify a clear way to attempt to answer the question, and you should know when you found the answer you're looking for. Make sure your research questions are specific and not too broad. You want to answer specific questions and produce meaningful data. And make sure your research questions aren't leading. Questions should be neutrally phrased so that they don't sound like you're assuming a particular answer to your question. For example, let's say your research goal is to make your dog walking app easier to use in order to keep customers. You might ask research questions like, on average, how many times a week does a user hire a dog walker through the app? Or, what frustrated users most about finding a dog walker through the app? One last thing to keep in mind about research questions. The way you write research questions will determine whether your research method should be quantitative or qualitative. You might remember that we talked about quantitative and qualitative research in an earlier video. Quantitative research focuses on data that can be gathered by counting or measuring. Think numbers. Qualitative research focuses on observations about why and how things happen. Think written descriptions. Let's revisit the example from our dog walking app. The first research question, on average, how many times a week does a user hire a dog walker through the app, will give you quantitative numerical data. The second research question, what frustrated users most about finding a dog walker through the app, will give you qualitative information. Both of these questions are important to consider for your design, and they focus on different parts of the user experience. All right, do you feel you can write a project background, research goals, and research questions? You can do it. For our next adventure, we'll describe how to measure the success of your journey. Ready to explore the world of key performance indicators? Welcome to the world of key performance indicators, the fourth element in a research plan. When conducting research, you'll want to have a way to measure the effectiveness of your product or prototype. For this, we use Key Performance Indicators, or KPIs. These are critical measures of progress toward an end goal. In this video, we'll check out six KPIs that can be useful in UX research studies. Time on task, use of navigation versus search, user error rates, drop-off rates, conversion rates, and system usability scale, or SUS. You ready? Let's dig in. First up, time on task. This measures how long it takes for a user to complete a task. A task could include filling out forms, making a purchase, or any other user activities. It's generally safe to assume that the less time it takes for users to perform a task, the more effective your UX design is. Next, we have use of navigation versus search. This KPI indicates the number of people who use a website or app's navigation compared to the number of people who use the search functionality. Think about when you visit a website. Do you use the navigation bar to get around the site, 
or do you go straight to the search bar and type in what you're looking for? There's no right answer. Everyone has their preference for how they get to where they want to go. Ideally, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to navigate the site. But if this KPI indicates that people use one navigation method way more than they use the other, you might want to adjust your design as a result. The third KPI, user error rates, indicate the parts of a design that cause users to make errors. An example might be that they click on the wrong icon when trying to check out their cart. The user error rates help point to areas where you need to make improvements to the UX. Keep in mind, though, that just because a design element has a low error rate doesn't necessarily mean it's a strong design. Study participants could use the product correctly but still not understand what they're doing. This can cause as much frustration as not being able to complete an action. The fourth KPI to keep in mind is drop-off rates, which show how many users abandon the experience. In other words, this shows how many users quit before reaching the end of a purchase or some other endpoint you're trying to lead them to. Maybe they got bored, or maybe they got frustrated because they couldn't do what they wanted. Either way, you want to decrease drop-off rates with each design iteration. On the other hand, a conversion rate is a number you want to see increase. It measures the percentage of users who complete a desired action. Let's say you want users to take multiple steps and make a purchase. The conversion rate tells you the percentage of users that actually made a purchase. Finally, if you want to answer the question, how easy is my app to use, and you need quantifiable answers, a system usability scale can help. A system usability scale, or SUS, is a questionnaire to measure the usability of your designs. With an SUS, users are asked to agree or disagree with 10 statements about the usability of a design. Statements like, I found the design unnecessarily complex, I thought the app was easy to use, and I felt very confident about using the app. The users are asked to respond to each statement on a strongly disagree to strongly agree scale. It's a quick and reliable way to know if a design is working. When conducting a study, you typically wouldn't use all six of these KPIs. Instead, you choose a couple that map most closely to your research goals. For example, if you want to determine the checkout process for your dog walker app, you might choose KPIs like time on task and conversion rate. Time on task measures how long it takes a user to complete a task, so how long it takes to find and book a dog walker. Conversion rate measures the percentage of users who successfully booked a dog walker. So you've now explored the world of key performance indicators, the fourth element in a research plan. Next up, we'll discuss the final elements of a research plan, methodology, participants, and script. See you there. Hello. By now, your research plan is taking shape quite nicely. It's time to progress from the background and goals of your study to your plans for actually carrying it out. In this video, we'll discuss these logistical details, which are known as the methodology. Methodology is the fifth element of your UX research plan. The methodology is the steps you take to conduct your research. Your methodology will list the procedures you'll use while collecting the information you need to answer your research questions. This should include the time and place of the product tests and interviews, as well as who will conduct them and how. There are a few reasons why you want to include methodology in your research plan. First, the methodology informs your stakeholders of what will happen during the study, how long the study is, and where it will take place. Second, detailing your methodology will give stakeholders more confidence in your study's results because they can see all of the steps. This makes it more likely they'll act on your suggestions. Finally, the methodology provides the details that other researchers need to repeat the exact same study in the future. In order for your research to be reliable, you need to document it in a way that another researcher could repeat it and find similar results. So for our dog walking app, we will conduct a usability study on March 12th and March 13th during normal business hours on March 12th and another after hours on March 13th. We will interview five participants individually. And that's it. You've nailed the fifth element of your UX research plan, the methodology. On to the next element, participants. See you there. Hi again. As you know, the field of UX is all about the user. We're moving into an exciting element of the UX research plan where we focus on the very important people who you will study, your participants. 
The participants you select represent the voice of real users, so this is an important part of your research plan. Keep in mind that how and where you find study participants will depend on where you work. Regardless, there are a few things you should include in this part of your research plan. To get started, your research plan should include a list of the primary characteristics of the people you will recruit to participate in the study. Have a good reason for each and every characteristic. The types of participants you select should be based on your research goals. For example, for a usability study for a dog walking app, you might want to recruit participants who are dog owners with full-time jobs and who go out for activities more than once a week. Detailing these characteristics is important because you want participants in the study to have things in common with your ultimate end user. In addition, listing characteristics of participants helps you avoid sample bias. You may remember that sample bias happens when you unintentionally choose study participants from a select group. While you want participants to have things in common with your end users, you still need to make sure that participants are representative of all users to make sure your results aren't skewed. You'll also want to create and include a link to a form called a screener survey, which you'll use to ask potential participants a series of questions to see if they meet your desired characteristics. In addition, you need to think through how to get participants to be part of your study, known as the incentive. The incentive also provides a way to thank participants for their time and feedback. For example, you could compensate them with cash or a gift card or enter them into a raffle for a prize. One more thing, it's important to engage participants with diverse perspectives and abilities for every product you design. For example, if you're designing an app to help people hire dog walkers, you might assume that your target user is someone who currently walks their dog twice per day and is tight on time. One characteristic, then, would be someone who walks their dog regularly. But what about users with visual impairments? They might also be interested in your dog walking app, so you need to make sure your app is compatible with screen readers. When recruiting participants for your usability study, you want to have a representative sample. The small group of participants in your usability study should represent your key user group, as well as user groups that are often marginalized. The goal of a usability study is to collect honest feedback from users, so you want to gather feedback from people with really diverse perspectives. In addition, you should also engage participants with diverse abilities during your usability studies. Understanding how people with disabilities use your product is a crucial part of the UX research and design process. If your product isn't already compatible with assistive technology, then you need to investigate how people with disabilities interact with your product. Don't assume you already know the workarounds that someone uses to navigate a product that wasn't designed with their specific needs in mind. Participants in a usability study can provide this feedback firsthand. There are many different ways to recruit potential users for your study that would include people with disabilities. To learn more, check out the reading that follows this video. With all of this in mind, you should be able to complete the sixth element of your UX research plan, participants. Without people to participate in your study, the study won't happen at all, so it's important to really get this part right. There's only one element to go. In the next video, we'll discuss the script, which is also known as the discussion guide. Let's get to it. Finally, we've made it to the last element of your research plan, the script. Keep in mind that the script is sometimes also referred to as the discussion guide. Interviewing users isn't just chatting with people. It's about getting to the core of what a user is trying to do, how they think and feel, and what their problems are. Your interview questions should be well thought out, consistent between the participants, and purposeful to get the data you need for useful insights. Even though it might feel a little robotic to read from a script during a usability study, there are a couple good reasons to do it. Two of the main reasons we use scripts is that we don't forget any instructions and so we keep language consistent for each participant. Have you ever gone to the doctors intending to ask a bunch of questions only to realize when you get home that you forgot to ask the most important one? Me too. That's frustrating in our personal lives, but it can create errors in a usability study. Prepare ahead of time to avoid having to redo the study. With this in mind, here are some tips for writing interview questions. First and foremost, use the same set of questions for each interview. Usually, usability studies focus on one person at a time 
and you want your conversations with each person to be about the same product features. For your user interviews to be consistent, you need to use the same base set of questions every time. Don't improvise or ask random questions to different participants. Second, ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions like, how did you feel about, and what bothered you about, are key to finding out what people are trying to do and what their problems are. Avoid yes or no questions because they can shut down detailed answers. Third, encourage elaboration. Sometimes in an interview, users answer a question briefly. For example, I didn't like that search page. If the user stopped there, you wouldn't know what part of the search page they didn't like or why they didn't like it. A good interviewer will then say, oh, tell me more about that to encourage elaboration. This is when you get the best information from your participant. Fourth, ask the same question from different angles. Interviewees often need a little time to get comfortable and used to the interview format, so it may take a while before you get to the core of what they really think. With that in mind, consider asking the same general question from multiple angles over the course of the interview. For example, you might ask, how often do you walk your dog at the start of the interview? Then, how many times a week does your dog need a walk in the middle of the interview? You'll probably get more detailed, useful data this way. Next, don't mention other users. Mentioning other users sets up possible privacy violations, and discussing how other users felt about the product being tested could bias the answers from your current participant. Finally, don't ask leading questions. Leading questions are questions designed to elicit a specific response. If you're a fan of courtroom dramas, you may have heard this sentence coming out of a lawyer's mouth, objection, leading the witness. You may not actively be trying to trick a study participant into giving a certain answer, but if you provide a possible response like, was it easy to find the checkout cart? You're leading the person answering the question toward an answer. That will provide bad data. So how do you actually write a script for a usability study in the real world? There are a few different parts of a script, which we'll go through in order. To get started, welcome participants to the study and thank them for their time. All usability studies should be recorded so that your team can rewatch them later. You need to let the participant know that you will record the study, and you need to ask the participant for consent to record. Then. Learn the participant's basic information, like name, age, and occupation. It's most common to do this by asking simple questions like, what is your name? In addition, it's important to remind participants before the study begins that they are not being tested. The goal is to provide honest feedback about the prototype or product they are testing. There are no right or wrong answers. And before you jump into the study itself, give participants the opportunity to ask questions. Now that you have the introduction out of the way, you're ready to provide usability tasks. These are the assignments given to participants that allow you to observe what they do. One way to make them sound less intimidating to participants is to call them activities during the usability study. So how do you come up with the tasks? Usability tasks should be based on the research goals written in your research plan. Tasks should also be specific. Make participants take action and avoid providing any clues on how to complete the task. Let's try to write a task together for the study we're conducting on the dog walking app. Our research goal was to determine if the app we designed is easy or difficult to use. Based on this goal, one task we could ask participants to do is book a dog walker on Friday at 2 p.m. Lastly, after the participant completes the usability tasks, you're ready to wrap things up. Ask any clarifying questions you might have, end the video recording, and then thank them for participating. That's it. You now know the seven elements of a UX research plan. The project, background, research goals, research questions, key performance indicators, methodology, participants, and script. You're ready to create your own plan. And you've completed the first of the four steps in a UX research study. Plan the study. Congratulations. Next, we'll discuss respecting privacy and user data when conducting research. These are important considerations to keep in mind as you develop your plan and conduct the study. See you then. We've covered a lot of ground on research plans and walked through each of the seven elements. In this video, we'll switch gears and discuss how to respect user privacy and data. 
We'll get into why privacy is important and the type of data you need to protect. We'll also think about what you can do as a designer to ensure user privacy. This part of research is really important, so let's get to it. Why is it important that you keep user data private? It's just the right thing to do. For ethical reasons, when conducting research, we should always act with integrity, and that includes protecting users' privacy. There are also several other reasons that privacy is so critical. One reason is privacy laws and ethics. If you don't maintain your users' privacy, you could be violating the law. In the United States, there are several regulations on information privacy, and in other parts of the world, privacy is more thoroughly legislated. Another reason why privacy is so important is the risk of hacking. You need to secure sensitive data to avoid getting hacked and risk hackers sharing users' data without their consent. This has happened in a lot of recent high-profile cases and is definitely something you want to avoid. A final reason privacy and data security is important is for protecting your company's brand. In other words, this is about ensuring that your users perceive your brand positively based on their experience with you. By emphasizing data protection, you gain their trust. And even though your research participants aren't necessarily customers, their perceptions about you and your company matter. Now let's discuss what user data needs protecting. There are two main types of data you need to protect. The first is personally identifiable information, or PII. This is made up of specific details that could be used to identify a user. This includes names, home addresses, email addresses, and phone numbers. The other type of data is sensitive, personally identifiable information, or SPII, and it's even more critical. SPII is data that, if lost, compromised, or stolen, could cause your users financial harm or embarrassment or potentially lead to their being discriminated against. This includes social security numbers, driver's license numbers, passport numbers, financial account numbers, date of birth, race, disability status, gender, sexuality, criminal history, and medical information. I bet you can imagine how these pieces of data could cause someone harm if they got into the wrong hands, and especially if these pieces of data are used together. The good news is that you can protect your users' data by making privacy and security a part of your UX design and research practices. Okay, so how do you do this? First off, be transparent about data collection. Let your users know what data is being collected. Next, only collect user data that's absolutely essential for your study. For example, if you don't need to know a participant's date of birth, don't ask for it. Also, get active consent from your users to have their data collected and used. Active means that participants have chosen to take part in a study. Usually, participants receive a consent form, which they are asked to sign and return to the researcher. Provide detail about how you'll use participants' information and protect their privacy. For example, you might let them know that you'll share their feedback with your team, but you'll anonymize their quotes by using person one, person two, and so on. Alternatively, you could present a group of quotes without identifying any participants. Next, allow users to withdraw at any time. This right to withdraw should be explicitly stated when obtaining consent. Also, make withdrawing easy to do. For example, you could allow participants to withdraw in writing, verbally, or simply by not showing up. Also, inform users of who will have access to their data. You might say, I'll share your feedback with my immediate team, but it won't be shared beyond that. And finally, clearly explain how you plan to store and delete users' data once it's been used. You might let them know you'll keep their videos on a secure cloud storage site until you've completed the study, and then it will be deleted. Remember, it's your responsibility to take care of user data, security, and privacy, and it's the right thing to do. In our next video, we'll explore a couple of specific privacy concerns and tools we can use to keep data safe. Ready to continue our discussion of privacy concerns? Let's get started. Remember in the last video when we discussed how important it is to get users' consent to collect data? While there are certain groups of people who have limited ability to provide their consent or have special privacy concerns, these groups are called vulnerable populations. There is not an established list of vulnerable populations, and people might have vulnerabilities that you're not aware of. 
Different populations can be vulnerable depending on the research you're doing. Some populations that might be considered vulnerable include minors, people with disabilities, people who are elderly, and prisoners. If you're planning to do research with vulnerable participants, ask a research expert what additional steps you need to take to remain ethical and compliant with privacy laws and guidelines. In addition to considering vulnerable populations, we also need to consider the safety of research data. This includes three main concerns. The first concern is data recording. It's important to document your study and results in a way that's consistent with UX research standards. Consistent documentation makes it easier to compare the results of any future studies and helps protect you and your company in case of an audit. An audit is a review from an outside party to inspect and verify that research involving people is ethical and follows the study protocol. The second concern is data storage. This is about making sure that your data is held in a way that's safe from hacking and safe from physical damage. The third concern is data retention. In this case, retention means how long you and your company hold on to research data. Some companies limit the amount of time records are kept. In other cases, you might have to comply with regulations on keeping records for a certain amount of time. Finally, you should have an agreement in place with the company you work for that lays out who keeps the research data if you leave the company. Okay, now that we've touched on a few special privacy concerns, let's check out a couple of tools you can use to maintain privacy. The first of these is de-identification. De-identification is removing any identifying information from a user's data that you collect during a study. For example, when sharing insights with the team, rather than attributing a quote to a participant by name, you might say participant one and change all pronouns to they. This can help reduce the amount of identifiable information about the participant that's shared with other people. Another option is to allow participants to choose their own fictitious name. This helps keep the human element instead of numbering participants like participant one. The second tool helps protect your own data and your company's data. This is called a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. A non-disclosure agreement is a contract that gives one party legal protection against another party stealing their ideas. When you have your research participants test out a new product or new feature, you're letting them experience something before it's public. This puts you at risk of having your idea stolen. But if you get your participants to sign non-disclosure agreements before your study begins, you then have legal protection against that risk. An NDA is a contract, and if someone breaks that contract, they might have to compensate you for the loss of your idea and any profit you may have lost out on because the idea was stolen. Well, that wraps up our discussion on privacy and UX research. In the next video, we'll quickly recap what we've covered so far in this course. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I am a user experience researcher at Google. A user experience researcher really focuses on the user. And we really like talking to people to understand how they're using our product, whether our products or services are working well for them, and what kind of pain points they have so that we can really improve them and make them better. Ethics, privacy, and data play a huge role in our, I guess, profession. I think it starts as early with who we decide to speak to when we conduct research. There have historically been voices that have been marginalized or not included in research, but being um, a woman and being Black, I've kind of experienced a lot of different things where I understand that the experiences that I'm having were not designed with me in mind. And so for me, on, on a personal level, it's extremely important that the people that we talk to and that we hear from uh, represent our user base, represent um, pretty much anyone in the world. <laughs> like we, we have to be respectful and mindful of that. Any ways that I as an individual or um, my team can kind of build that more into the process, like looking into how we are recruiting, how we are conducting interviews, how we're making recommendations, how we're interpreting information, how it's being shared, um, and then how it's being used to build products. Every step um, 
really can can create great outcomes or unintended consequences for that person that's using it. I think when it comes to privacy and data, there are a lot of different topics that we tend to get into in research, especially depending on what kind of uh, product or service that you're working on and talking about. When we look at data across a large number of users or um, kind of identify patterns of how people are using things, um, all of which I think the public sometimes has very um, concerned opinions about in terms of, do I want people knowing how many times I log into a certain account or um, what kinds of websites that I'm visiting? Um, so I think things like that are, are definitely um, alarming for people. And as researchers, um, just trying to respect that, understand that there's just like a variety of ways that I think we can continue to be very careful with how we treat people's data and information and stories and just be very respectful. Try to relate to it on a personal level. If that was me, do I want someone doing that with my data? So I think if we kind of design things and conduct research in a way that respects the gravity of what we're doing and what we're putting out into the world, it can really make a difference. Great job. You're making your way through this course and the steps of a UX research study. To begin, you learned about the four steps in a UX research study. Then you dove deep into the first step, planning a study. There are seven elements of a UX research plan and we explored each of them. The project background, research goals, research questions, key performance indicators, KPIs, methodology, participants, and script. Lastly, you investigated why and how to include data privacy in user research. Coming up, we'll move from the first step of planning a research study to the second step, conducting the research. To conduct research, we'll dig into one popular method, usability studies. See you there. Welcome back. It's great to see you again. Earlier, we explored how to plan a study, the first of four steps in your UX research study. We also investigated why and how to include data privacy in user research. Now it's time to move on to the second step, conducting research. Conducting research is an essential part of getting feedback from participants, but it can be tricky. It requires choosing the right study method for your design and limiting biases that are likely to pop up in our research, like attitudes and stereotypes we associate to certain people or the tendency of participants to agree with those they like. For our lesson, we will focus on usability studies to conduct our research. Usability studies are a research method that assesses how easy it is for participants to complete core tasks in a design. We'll also explore how to reduce bias and be inclusive when conducting usability studies. Then we'll wrap up by learning how to take notes while observing participants in a usability study. This sound like a task you're up for? If so, we'll get started by learning the basics of usability studies. You know all about the first step in a UX research study, which is planning the study. It's time to move to the second step, which is really exciting, conducting the research. So let's get started. A usability study is a research method that assesses how easy it is for participants to complete core tasks in a design. During a usability study, researchers follow participants as they interact with a product. The user's feedback helps the design team make important improvements to the user experience. Usability studies can take place at various points in the design process. You can conduct a usability study when you have an early idea, like a lo-fi prototype that is only somewhat interactive. Often this is called concept testing. You can also conduct a usability study when you have an interactive prototype. This is the most common time to conduct a study because it gives the design team insight on what needs to be revised or added before the product launches. You can even conduct a usability study with a product that is complete. You may want to change a feature of the product or test if the product is usable with a specific group of people. Imagine this scenario. A local bakery has a website, but customers can't place their orders online. The bakery has asked you to create a new feature that will allow customers to order on their website. 
You've created a prototype of the website that includes this new feature to place an online order. You decide to conduct a usability study to understand how easy it is for users to complete an order. As part of the study, participants navigate the prototype from the landing page to checkout, acting as if they're real customers. As a researcher, you collect feedback as you watch the users interact with the prototype. In some usability studies, you can even interview participants after they're done interacting with the prototype in order to get more feedback. You might be wondering, how much feedback about my design should I get? We recommend recruiting a handful of participants for a usability study. For our examples, we'll have five participants in the usability study. This sample size is large enough to uncover major user issues, but small enough to keep the cost down. Let's focus on one of our usability study participants, Alex. As part of the study, Alex tries to order a birthday cake for their son on the prototype of the bakery's website. By following Alex through the ordering process, you discover that Alex's user journey hits a problem. First, the birthday cake that Alex wants to order for their son is pretty specific. They want a rectangular rainbow cake topped with rainbow sprinkles and a unicorn placed in each of the four corners of the cake. Alex selects a rectangular rainbow cake without any trouble, and Alex adds the rainbow sprinkles by selecting them from a drop-down menu labeled Decorations. Alex notices that unicorns are also on the decorations list, so they are selected easily. But then Alex hits a problem and veers off the happy user path. When Alex adds the unicorn decoration, there's no quantity option, so Alex can't order four unicorns. There's also not a section for notes, so Alex is not able to specify that the unicorn should be placed in each corner of the cake. To add to Alex's frustrations, the prototype site does not include a help button. During the usability study, Alex is open and honest about these problems. Thanks to Alex's feedback, the design team can now work out solutions to improve the bakery's website. Keep in mind, usability studies give UX designers a way to test their designs and get feedback without much risk and a lot of reward. While the user feedback might not all be positive, it will always, always make the product better. Coming up, we'll get to know the two types of usability studies, moderated and unmoderated. Let's go. Now that we know the basics of usability studies, we'll get into some specifics. There are two types of usability studies, moderated and unmoderated. Let's check them out. In moderated usability studies, a person guides participants through the study in real time. The person who guides participants through the study is known as the moderator. The moderator's goal is to help participants interact with the product and collect their feedback along the way. On the other hand, unmoderated usability studies do not have a designated moderator. In unmoderated usability studies, participants test out the prototypes without human guidance. Usually the study is recorded on video and the UX team reviews the video footage after the study. Moderated and unmoderated usability studies have benefits and limitations depending on the scope and goals of your study. To compare these two types, let's walk through the benefits and limitations for each in detail. We'll start with some of the benefits of moderated usability studies. First, in moderated usability studies, the moderator guides the participant through the study. For example, the moderator might show the participant where to click and ask them about their experience when taking that action. This is beneficial because participants take the exact actions you want to get feedback about. Second, moderated studies allow the moderator to ask specific questions and follow up in real time to learn more. Similarly, the moderator can rephrase a question that a participant is not understanding. This is beneficial because it allows you to collect more information that you can act on to improve your design. Third, moderated usability studies allow for rapport building between the moderator and participant, which can help the participant open up and share more feedback about the design. Building rapport is especially important if the design being tested deals with sensitive or personal issues. Okay, so moderated usability studies sound pretty great, right? Well, they also have some limitations. The moderator could influence or bias the participants. Because a person is guiding the study, there's a chance that person can accidentally let their own thoughts or feelings come into the study. Also, moderated usability studies are less flexible. It's harder to reach populations like single parents or night shift workers who may be unavailable during the daytime hours. The study can also be difficult to reschedule if a participant does not show up. 
In addition, there's a chance that the participant may not identify with the moderator. This could make the participant less comfortable and less open with their feedback. There are many more benefits and limitations to moderated usability studies, which you can learn about in the upcoming reading. All right, let's shift gears and think about unmoderated usability studies. Remember, unmoderated studies did not have a person guiding the participants. Let's discuss the benefits of this type of study. First, it's easier to see how a participant uses the product in the real world. In unmoderated usability studies, you give the participant a list of tasks to complete on their own. This helps you see how the participant would experience your product without a moderator guiding each step. Second, unmoderated usability studies allow participants to complete tasks on their own time and in their own space because there is no need for a moderator. This also makes it easier to schedule unmoderated studies. Third, depending on the subject matter, especially if it's sensitive, participants may feel more comfortable giving feedback without others around. As you might have guessed, there are also limitations to unmoderated usability studies. In an unmoderated usability study, participants have no human guidance. Participants get a list of fixed questions and tasks, but if they have issues or need technical assistance, there's often no one to help them. Next, unmoderated usability studies don't give the UX team an opportunity to ask the participant real-time follow-up questions. This can be limiting if the participant does not explain their problem in detail because there's no way to follow up once the UX team watches the recording. Lastly, there is little to no control over the environment to ensure you have the participant's full attention. Without a moderator present, participants could multitask and not be focused on the key activities in the study. Ultimately, to decide which type of usability study to conduct, the UX team has to consider the scope and goals of the study and the types of participants you are trying to reach. Next up, we'll talk about how usability studies are structured. Hey everyone, now that you know the basics of usability studies, it's time to watch one in action. Earlier, you learned that usability studies can be moderated or unmoderated. Join me as I conduct an unmoderated usability study so you can get a feel for how this works in the real world. Let's continue to imagine that we are on a UX team that is creating an app to help people find and schedule dog walkers. The design team wants to learn how easy it is for users to go through the main user experience of finding and scheduling dog walkers in the app. To figure this out, I've been asked to lead an unmoderated usability study for the dog walking app. I'll have participants test our low fidelity prototype. I've recruited five participants to provide feedback from the comfort of their own homes. I'll need your help to watch the recordings of the five participants. As a researcher, your goal is to pay attention to how each user responds to the tasks they are asked to perform. As you watch each video, you'll see the participants try to complete a series of tasks that the design team wants to get feedback on. The participants will also share what they are thinking as they try to complete the tasks. Since this is your first usability study, just get a feel for how the process works as you watch each participant. For future studies, you'll take notes during the study, but let's keep it simple for now. It looks like the recordings for each participant just got uploaded. Let's get started with our first one. Hi there, I'm Toby. I'm going to be completing this usability study on an app to help people schedule dog walkers. This is the first time I've ever done a study like this. I go out of town on the weekends a lot, and since I have two dogs, I definitely could use something like this to make sure my dogs are well cared for while I'm away. So let's check out what I need to do here. Prompt 1. Pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Note, the product is only an example, so you will not be able to change the date or time on the screen. Okay, so I'm opening the app, and I'm not exactly sure if I pick Schedule or Dog Walkers Near You. That's a little confusing. Kind of seems like you can do both here. I guess I'll try Schedule since I'm trying to find a date and time. Okay. Seems like I'm in the right place, and I don't need to fill out the date and time here. Kind of weird that I don't get to choose my own date and time with this product, since it's an example. What's the point of selecting a dog walker if you can't say when you want them to come? I guess that might be included when the product is a little more well-developed. Prompt 1 follow-up. 
Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change about the process of scheduling a dog walker? It would have been nice if I could schedule from an actual calendar instead of the two text boxes for date and time. Then I'd know what days of the week this all aligned with. I need a dog walker every Saturday morning, but it's not like I know which days of the calendar align with a Saturday. You know what I mean? Like when I see a date like May 2nd, I don't know which day of the week that is, so I just have to pull up my own calendar to compare. So I guess I'll just press submit. Prompt two, select a dog walker. Okay, now I'm looking at all the dog walkers available at this date and time. There's a lot to look at, tons of profiles. How am I supposed to really know who to choose to walk my dog? Any of these profiles right now seem fine to me. I'll say that this one right here works. I think I need to click the learn more button. Prompt three, confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. Got it, okay. I'm going to click book right here. This seems fairly simple. What the heck? It looks like this is a page with details about my booking and the total cost. The app didn't even give me a page to confirm the dog walker I selected or the date and time I need. I'm not even sure if I had all the right details, but it went right to confirming the appointment. That's so annoying. I feel like most apps let you review what you're booking before you actually finish paying. Well, I guess I completed the task since it seems like it would be the final page. Prompt three follow up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy that the app booked the dog walker without letting me review what I was going to book. I was just trying to click around, not actually confirm anything. I can imagine if I was using the app with my real credit card details, I would definitely want to be able to review and confirm the dog walker and the time I want to schedule before actually confirming. Prompt four, from the home page, figure out where you would go to edit your address. Address, ha! Huh. Well, that might have been a nice thing to add in before I click the book button. Seriously. Okay, mm, I guess I'll click the X to get out of this and try to get back to the home page. Hmm, this is confusing. I don't see anything here about adding my address. It has to be here somewhere. I know it's not under the schedule button or in this list of dog walkers near me. So I mean, is it under the latest tips button? Okay, not here. Let me go back to the home page. God, I give up. I don't see the word address listed anywhere on the home page, so I really don't know where this would be. Prompt five. Would you use the dog walking app? I definitely see myself using an app to find and schedule a dog walker like this if it was better to use. I need someone to help with my dogs when I'm out of town, so this app might be able to do that. I also would like a way to book a dog walker every Saturday morning, like on a recurring basis. It seems like you can only book one appointment at a time for this. That's kind of annoying too. Anyway, I think that's it. I'll log out now. Okay, hi, I think this is recording and ready. My name is Taj. Let's see how this goes. Prompt one, pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Note, the product is only an example, so you will not be able to change the date or time on the screen. Okay, so to pick a dog walker, I don't really know if dog walkers near you is how to schedule or if this schedule rectangle thing is the way to go. I'm a bit confused. I'll try the schedule thing. Okay, cool. It seems like that worked because the app went to the next screen. I'm going to assume if this was clickable, I'd see a calendar at this point.
or it looks like maybe these two rectangles are both boxes that I would type a date and time into. Interesting. One thing I'm thinking about for myself and my own dogs is that it doesn't seem like there's a way to schedule a reoccurring dog walker. Like if I want someone to come walk the dog every week at the same time. This scheduling page seems like it's only a one-time appointment for this one date and one time. Anyway, I'll go ahead and click the submit thing, which I think is a button. Prompt one follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change about the process of scheduling a dog walker? I mean, it was a bit hard to figure out which button to press on the home screen, but that's okay. That could be fixed, but I still figured it out. Also, I think there needs to be a way to do a reoccurring booking. Almost everyone I know with a dog doesn't schedule individual appointments like this. They want someone to walk their dog at the same time or on the same day every week or something like that. Prop 2. Select a dog walker. Okay, so it looks like there's a lot of options here. And I can scroll through even more dog walkers. Any of these work for me. So I'm going to click one of these rectangles that say learn more. Looks like I'm in the right place. Cool. This seems like more details about a dog walker named Jane Doe. Prompt 3. Confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. Got it, okay. I'm going to click book right here. This one seems obvious since it's big at the top of the screen. Oh, that was super easy. Looks like I'm all set. I have this congratulations page, which I guess means my booking of a dog walker is all good. Prop 3 follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? Wouldn't really change anything. That was pretty easy. I got it done quickly. Prop 4. From the home page, figure out where you would go to edit your address. Got it. Well, let me see if I can go back here. I think I need to press this X to get out of this screen. Ah, yes, I'm back on the home screen of the app. Cool. So if I'm looking for a place to edit my address, it's probably here under the logo for a person. Usually, in other apps, there's a profile page with all of your personal details like address. So I wonder if this app will be the same. Great. Yes. Found it. It says address right here. Prompt 5. Will you use the dog walking app? Uh, I don't know if that's useful, especially since you can't book a reoccurring time. Like, I don't really know if I would just book a dog walker one date at a time. Seems like a lot of effort. To be honest, I don't think I'd really use it the way it's currently set up, but thanks for letting me try it out. Okay, I'm Orion. I'm joining a usability study about scheduling and booking a dog walker. So excited to get started, and I'm sure that this will be fun. Maybe I'll even get to use this app to actually book a dog walker in the future. Okay, let's start the prompts and figure out how this dog walking app works. Prompt 1. Pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Note, the product is only an example, so you will not be able to change the date or time on the screen. I work as a teacher and I volunteer to coach sports after school, like volleyball. So my puppies, Reggie and Snowball, are often left home alone for long periods of time. I'm excited to see how easy this app is to use. Okay, so let me get started here. Alright, looks like I'm on the home page of the app. I need to pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Seems like there are some tips at the top here. That's useful. Oh great, there's a bottom that says schedule. I bet this is the one I need to click on. Great, looks like I'm doing this right so far. I was taken to the next page of the app. Now I'm supposed to pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker, but it looks like this information is already filled in. I am imagining that if I pick a real date and time that I want someone to walk my doggies. Then I press the submit button here. There we go. Prompt 1 to follow up. 
Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would want to change about the process of scheduling a dog walker? I can't say I changed anything honestly. The task was super easy to complete. Schedule a walk was nice and clear with a big button and I knew right away where to click. Easy peasy. Prompt two, select a dog walker. Okay, so it looks like there's a lot of options for the dog walkers here. And it says that these folks are near me. That's cool. Seems like there will be a lot of detail here to choose from. I'm going to guess I just click learn more here on the person who seems like the best dog walker. Again, these buttons are really clear, which makes it easy. Yep, that worked. Now I'm on what it seems like a profile page with details about specific dog walker. The dog walker here is named Jane Doe. How fun, looks great. Prompt three, confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. This seems pretty self-explanatory. I'm just going to click the book button at the top of the screen here. Oh nice, that was super easy. Looks like I'm all set on that one too. This message here is so upbeat with congrats and an exclamation point. That's cute. Prompt three follow up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? That was really easy to do. I guess if I'm a little bit picky, it would have been nice to have some kind of confirmation page before the booking actually happened. Like, it would be nice to review the details of my reservation to make sure I'm all set before the booking is confirmed. The other thing is, I usually want to book a dog walker every day after school when I'm coaching sports. So I would need a way to set that up to be recurring so the same dog walker could come see my doggies at the same time each day. Prompt 4. From the homepage, figure out where you would go to edit your address. Okay, well it looks like I just hit the X here. And yep, that took me back to the homepage where I started. Great! Then I'm going to click the logo that represents a profile page in this top right corner of the app. Yep, just as I expected. Cool, okay, so I'll click edit profile here and update my address. Seems pretty easy like other apps I've used before. Prompt 5, would you use the dog walking app? Yeah, I definitely use this for sure. It really seems super simple to use. I just love to see a little more customization and of course some more actual details of the content. After that, I think it's pretty much ready to go. Thanks for letting me try it out today. Hi there, I'm PETA. I'm excited to give this app a try. I don't have a dog myself, I wish, but I help take care of my mom who is 84 years old and is in pretty poor health. She has a really sweet dog, but she really doesn't have time to take care of him. I try to walk him every day, but sometimes it would be nice if I had help. Anyways, I'm excited to check out this app to learn more about the dog walkers. Prompt one, pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. The product is only an example, so you'll not be able to change the date and time on the screen. Hmm. Okay, so it looks like I'm on the first screen of the app. Maybe like a home page? Even though, there's this schedule button. It's kind of confusing. Wouldn't I want to click on this dog walkers near you section so I could schedule something who's nearby my location? Hmm. It's probably more like to be scheduled because that seems more likely to be a button you'd click. That worked. Now I need to select a date and time for the dog walker to come by my house. It's kind of annoying that there isn't a calendar view here. Hmm. I know I need a dog walker on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 a.m., but I would never know what date that goes with. Uh, if I just saw a date like May 2nd, I have no clue which day of the week this is. Anyway, this seems straightforward, and I'd click the Submit button after I choose my date and time. Prompt 1. Follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change about the process of scheduling a dog walker? Well, it was confusing in the beginning to know if I needed to click on one of those profiles or the schedule button. I would also like a calendar view when selecting a date. Prompt two, select a dog walker. Okay, so I assume all of these people are available at the selected time? 
There's not any detail here, so I don't really know what I'd pick or who to use. Is there any difference between any of these people? What do all these lines mean? Oh, there we go. I need to click the learn more thing on the right hand side of the screen. Prompt three. Confirm booking a dog walker and complete the checkout process. Hmm. Is booking the same thing as completing the checkout process? Is there a cart or something? Let me go back. Maybe I missed an add to cart button. I'd expect to see an add to cart or something here. I'm not sure on this one. Okay, let me go to the learn more page that was on earlier. This must be somewhere. Okay, so it looks like I'm back here again. My only option seems to be click on the book button, so I'll try it. Oh wow, seems like that worked. Although I really don't know what happened. The screen says congrats and total cost, but I don't really know what I booked or clicked. Like there was no confirmation page to tell me about the dog walker, the time or price I was scheduling. How strange. I don't think I ever had this happen before. Hmm. Prompt three, follow up. Did you find these tasks easier or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? Considering I had to go back and forth between screens of the app, that was not simple. Usually with any sort of checkout process, there's an add to cart function. I was just clicking on different buttons to try to figure it out. Prompt four, from the homepage, figure out where you would go to edit your address. Okay, so I need to go back to the homepage first. I bet I clicked the X button in the corner. Ah, yes. Okay, this makes more sense. Editing an address is going to be under this profile icon thingy. I bet. Great, got it. Hey, at least I got this one right. So yeah, I go ahead and just type in my address here where it says address info. Prompt five, would you use a dog walking app? In general, a dog walking app is definitely something I'd use. The checkout process for this app could be a little more smoother though. But otherwise, I think it's a nice way to book something for my mom and her dog. I think once a more final version is out, I could definitely see myself using it. All right, that's it, I think. Bye. Hi there, I'm Andy. Let's see how this goes. Pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Note, the product is only an example, so you will not be able to change the date or time on the screen. Okay, I need to pick a date and time. This part seems pretty clear. I'm gonna select schedule here and just click on it. Uh, yeah, so to me, this seems like just a one-off appointment, but in my life, I would always want to book multiple dog walking sessions, like a recurring appointment for every week or every other week. I don't really think booking a one-off dog walk is that great, but let me just hit submit here. Prompt one follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change about the process of scheduling a dog walker? Yeah, like I was saying, I think there needs to be a way to do a recurring booking. Almost everyone I know with a dog doesn't schedule individual appointments like this. It would also take a long time to have to re-enter your information every time you want to book a dog walker. Prompt two, select a dog walker. Okay, so it seems like there's a lot of options here for dog walkers, I guess. I'm not really sure what I'm looking for exactly. Does learn more mean to book that dog walker or just get more information about each person? It's not really clear how I select a dog walker from this list. Okay, let me try clicking learn more on one of these items of the list. Oh, that took me to a new page, so I think that worked. Prompt three, confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. Got it. Okay, I'm going to click the book rectangle right here, I guess. Uh, wait, I, I think that was the end of the process. Like it just booked an appointment without asking me if I wanted to confirm or showing me what I was booking. That's honestly super annoying. If I was actually paying for this, I would be pretty angry if I didn't know what I was booking. Prop three follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? It was really disorienting that there wasn't a confirmation page for the dog walker that I was booking. It went straight from the profile page of a dog walker to a congrats page. What if I had made a wrong click or if I wanted to change something about my appointment? Also, I wish I could filter the dog walkers by experience level. It, it wasn't really clear what their differences were or how I would choose one dog walker over another. Prompt four, from the home page, figure out where you would go to edit your address. 
Okay, so I guess I click this X to get out of the screen because it doesn't seem like there's anything else I could click. Uh, yep, that worked. And I'm back on the first page I saw at the start of this thing. And then from here, it seems pretty obvious that I'd click this logo for a person, which is probably a profile of some kind. All right, and now I'm guessing I'd hit this edit profile rectangle button thing and just type here to change my address. Seems pretty easy. Prompt five, would you use the dog walking app? So an app to help you find and book a dog walker is definitely useful. I'm still super annoyed that there was no confirmation page in this app though. I'd really want a way to fix this more, or I'd want to be able to schedule a dog walker twice a week at the same date and time, or to select a full week I'm away. It doesn't look like those are options yet. I also think a filter to let me pick my dog walker by how much experience they have would make me feel a lot more comfortable about who to choose. But yeah, other than that, I think it works all right. Okay, I think that's it for now. Welcome back. How was watching your first unmoderated usability study? Hopefully, you now have a feel for how an unmoderated usability study is conducted in the real world. Pretty cool, right? As we discussed earlier, there are two types of usability studies, moderated and unmoderated. We're going to shift our focus to moderated usability studies now. In this video, you'll learn how to moderate a usability study yourself. We'll start from the beginning of the study and focus on how to connect with participants before the study actually begins. Ready to get started? First, it's really important to build a rapport with participants. Ask general questions about how they're doing or what their day has been like. Doing this before the study starts can go a long way to make the participant feel comfortable. You want to establish a professional but friendly rapport with the participants right from the start. Second, thank participants for coming. Don't skip over this step. Make sure participants know how grateful you are that they're taking the time to participate in the study. Even after the study is conducted, it's important to show how grateful you are for their participation. You can do this by sending them off with a small thank you gift. It's also helpful to remind participants that their feedback on the product has the potential to help millions of users. It's important to be open and honest about their experience so the design team can make improvements. If a participant is worried about offending the design team, you won't get the useful feedback you're after. Emphasize that nothing they say will offend you or hurt your feelings and that any issues that they have navigating your design will probably come up for many other participants too. Let the participant know that you're here to find out how to improve the design, so constructive criticism is more than welcome. Next, it's time to have participants fill out paperwork. You'll likely have participants complete a non-disclosure agreement, or NDA, which we've discussed earlier. This might sound intimidating, but your job as the study moderator is to frame this in a casual and approachable way. Since the designs they'll provide feedback on might not have launched yet, you want to ensure participants don't share any details about the designs with the outside world. But it's not all about us. If the NDA is set up correctly, it helps build trust with participants and increase rapport. This is especially important with participants from historically marginalized communities or at-risk populations who have often been taken advantage of in research. Once the NDAs are signed, explain the focus of the study and what participants will give feedback on. Give the participant a roadmap or a preview of what's to come. It's always a good idea to let them know what to expect and then to ask, does this sound good? Make it a practice to check in with the participant to make sure they're comfortable with what you've planned. Now it's time to establish the ground rules for the study. For example, you might want participants to use the think aloud method, meaning you want them to explain what's on their mind while they're doing it. This is the time to let participants know what you'd like them to do and give them specific examples of how, for instance, a think aloud might work. Also remind participants that they are not being tested. There are no right or wrong answers to any of the questions you ask. If the participant can't complete a task, that isn't a reflection of their personal abilities. It's a reflection of the design's usability. You want this to be a low pressure experience. No participant should leave a study feeling like they failed somehow. The goal is to understand how the user is experiencing your product. So there's no right or wrong answer. There's one more thing to keep in mind when moderating a usability study. Keep your emotions neutral. Your mood should not impact your judgment or influence your participants' feedback. Make time to reflect on your emotional state before the usability study begins. This helps you separate your emotions from what goes on during the study. 
And if you have a hard time keeping your emotions neutral during the study for some reason, this reflection can help you identify where your emotions might have influenced your research. And that's it. You now know how to get started at the beginning of a moderated usability study. You may be noticing a theme. In UX design, you want to keep the user front and center in all of your work. And in UX research, you want to keep the participant front and center each step of the way. The best practices we just shared are all about the participant and their experience during the usability study. Up next, we'll move into how to effectively communicate with participants during the actual usability tasks. Let's keep going. Hi again. You're doing a great job learning about moderating a usability study. You've set the stage at the beginning of the study to make your participants feel comfortable and confident. Now let's focus on how to effectively communicate with participants during the usability tasks. When you're the moderator of a usability study, your main goal is to pay attention to and understand your participants. To conduct a successful moderated usability study, you need to know what kinds of questions to ask participants and how to ask them. So let's go through a few techniques for moderation during the usability study itself. The first technique for moderation is to ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are questions that cannot be answered with a simple yes or no response. This gives participants more opportunities to provide feedback. For example, after participants complete a task in the usability study, ask, how do you think that went? Instead of, did you like it? As you interview participants, there might be times when you have trouble understanding their feedback, or you may not be sure if you're correctly interpreting what the participant is saying. That's totally fine. All you need to do is ask some follow-up questions so the participant can clarify what they mean. This is our second technique for moderating a usability study, ask follow-up questions. Ask questions like, tell me more about that, or can you expand on that? These questions will help you avoid making assumptions about what the participant might have meant. If you're still unsure what the participant's feedback means, try to summarize their answer for confirmation. Repeat back what you think the participant means and allow them to correct or confirm the statement. Be careful not to summarize their feedback for confirmation right away or you'll run the risk of leading the participant to a certain answer. Always ask the participant open-ended and follow-up questions first, then use this technique if you're still unclear. All right, now you know a few techniques for moderation during the usability study itself. Make in progress. As you're moderating a usability study, keep in mind that you'll have a diverse group of participants. As a researcher, you come into the study with biases you need to be aware of. Next up, we'll learn about biases that are likely to come up when you're moderating usability studies. Hi, my name is Dina. I'm a senior user experience researcher at Google. User experience research is critical at every stage of the product development lifecycle. In the very early stages of product development, we need to uncover the right solution by understanding what the problems are. So user experience helps us to understand from people's perspective what the problems they are and how they're experiencing it and how they imagine we could help through the design of technology to improve on the problems that they're facing. User experience can help us validate whether we came up with the right solution and once we launch, user experience helps us to evaluate. Now that we've built a product or services and it's out in the real world, is it really meeting the need in the way that we expected or imagined? And if not, how can we improve? Finally, user experience is really good to constantly remain innovating as a company. I'm always on the side of the people who are using our products and our services. I want to ensure that the experience that we put out there works for them. I feel really great when we've hit the mark, but as a user experience researcher, I know that's not always the case. There are times where we miss the mark, and it is my job to bring those insights back to the team unfiltered so that we can make improvements. One of the core methods that I employ is interviewing and observations. That means I tend to be out visiting people where they are in their own context, such as the workplace, in their homes, I observe, I interview, I understand what life, daily life is for them. 
and try to translate that back to what that means for the products we build. The thing I love most about my job as a researcher is the fact that I can get to connect with people, understand the problems, be a part of creating solutions to these problems, and I get to do that all over the world. I've conducted research in six continents to date. As you can imagine, that means I'm in cultures and places and speaking to people of all different backgrounds and with all different kinds of pain points and problems. And I get a chance to be a part of creating something that is going to provide value, not just for some, but for everyone. Hi there. You might remember when we discussed biases in UX research in an earlier course. In this video, we'll focus on biases that might occur when you moderate usability studies. Remember, a bias is favoring or having prejudice based on limited information. It's important to call out that all humans are susceptible to bias. Yes, even you and me. The key is to identify and become aware of these biases so that you can guard against them. Identifying your own personal biases can be challenging. Because bias is usually unconscious, a lot of times we don't even realize we're experiencing it. But if you know what biases you have, you can take steps to minimize their effects. Let's go over some common biases you or your participants might have during usability studies. Let's start by discussing a couple of biases that you might have as a moderator during a usability study. The first bias is one we've already discussed, implicit bias or unconscious bias. Remember, implicit bias is the collection of attitudes and stereotypes we associate to people without our conscious knowledge. These attitudes and stereotypes are often negative, exclusionary, or disempowering. When recruiting participants for usability studies, any implicit biases you have against a particular user group might impact your expectations for how those participants will interact with the product. Another bias you might have as a moderator during a usability study is serial position effect which we've discussed in a previous video. Serial position effect is a psychological bias that states that when given a list of items, people are more likely to remember the first few and the last few, while the items in the middle tend to blur. Be aware that when you're interviewing participants, the first and last things they reveal might stand out to you more than the feedback in the middle because of the serial position effect. Similarly, your participants might experience the serial position effect. If you give participants a list of instructions, they're more likely to remember the first and last items on the list. Next up, another bias often experienced by participants, friendliness bias. Friendliness bias describes the tendency of people to agree with those they like in order to maintain a non-confrontational conversation. Think about this in the real world. Has your friend ever asked you if you want to eat at their favorite restaurant? Even if you hate the food, you might agree to go to their favorite restaurant in order to avoid confrontation. While this might have benefits in the social world, in the world of usability studies, it can present a bit of an obstacle. As a moderator, if you are too friendly and develop too strong a rapport with participants, there's a chance participants will want to agree with you in order to avoid confrontation. This can stop participants from giving honest feedback. Your goal is to improve the product's design, so remind participants that you actually need honest feedback in order to improve the product. The last bias moderators need to guard against is the social desirability bias, which describes the tendency for people to answer questions in a way that will be viewed favorably by others. You've probably seen this happen in your own life. Imagine you're with a group of friends who are talking about a movie they enjoyed. One of them asks you, did you like the movie? And everyone turns to see your response. You're likely to say, yes, I loved it, to be viewed favorably by the group, even if you didn't actually love it. Similarly, in usability studies, the social desirability bias can cause participants to focus on the positive aspects of their experience with the product and minimize the negative aspects. One way to guard against this bias is to provide participants with a series of statements that came from other users. Ask participants which statement they most relate to and emphasize that there's no correct answer. Okay, you're becoming a pro when it comes to usability studies. You now know the bias to watch out for when you're conducting a usability study and interacting with participants. Coming up, we'll continue this conversation and share some strategies for reducing your own bias during usability studies. See you there. Welcome back. You now know a few common types of bias that can come into play during usability studies. Keep in mind that being aware of biases like these is actually the first step in reducing them. 
so we're already on our way. In this video, we'll explore strategies for reducing your own bias when conducting usability studies. The first thing you can do to overcome bias is to identify and admit your own biases. As part of our work, UX designers make a lot of assumptions, but we also test them out and revise them when we get new information. By acknowledging your own biases, you can be more objective and question your assumptions as you conduct a usability study. For example, imagine you're designing a website that sells handbags. Before we design the website, let's start with a little introspection or soul searching. Make sure you have a piece of paper and a pen ready. Pause the video if you need to grab supplies. Think about handbags and answer the following questions. We'll give you 10 seconds to write down ideas for each one. Who uses handbags? How are handbags used? What other thoughts do you have when you think about the word handbags? Let's review what you've written down. When asked the questions, who uses handbags, did you list a certain group of people, like women? Did you consider that men might also carry handbags? If you primarily thought about handbags being used by women, you may have a bias that men are not interested in handbags. In some cultures, it's common for men to use handbags every day. And when asked the question, how are handbags used, did you list to carry lipstick, keys, or a wallet? Based on what you listed, you may have a bias that handbags are used to carry certain items. Sometimes handbags are used to carry dogs or your lunch. Learning about all of your biases will take a lot of work and reflection. It might even be hard and uncomfortable. This exercise is just one simple example to get you thinking about what your biases might be. Being aware of your own biases can help you avoid forming any opinions before you have results from your research. When conducting usability studies, be sure to phrase questions in a way that allows for a diversity of responses. The next thing you can do to reduce bias when conducting usability studies is to find participants from a representative sample. The small group of participants you conduct your usability study with should represent your key user group, as well as user groups that are often marginalized. Next, define the research criteria beforehand. Remember when you created a plan for your usability study? A couple of the key elements focused on the research goals and research questions. By establishing research goals with your team before the usability study begins, you reduce the chance of designer biases leading you down the wrong path. Also, phrase interview questions thoughtfully. If we ask a participant, do you like the design experience, we might not get all the information we need. Stick to open-ended, non-leading questions like, how did it go? What was your experience like? Or what worked and what didn't work for you and why? Remember, the goal of usability studies is to get honest feedback from the participants. Next, let participants express themselves fully and in their own words. During the usability study, make sure you understand exactly how participants feel and why. As we discussed earlier, if you need more clarity on what a participant says, ask a follow-up question. Finally, be mindful of your body language. Remember the friendliness bias? A lot of us are people pleasers. If you react favorably to something when you are the moderator by nodding or smiling, this might encourage participants to share feedback that will get them more nods or smiles. Body language like this can bias the feedback that participants provide. Identifying your own biases and how your actions can bias participants is a long process that takes a lot of practice. You've learned some of the most common biases in UX research and effective strategies for combating bias, so you're already off to a great start. Coming up, we'll learn how to take notes during a usability study. Now that you know how to conduct your study and avoid biases in the process, it's time to think about another important part of usability study, note taking. In this video, we'll explore why you need to take notes during a usability study and who takes notes and ways to take effective notes. You might be wondering why we take notes during a usability study, especially if the session is being recorded. 
Well, there are a lot of reasons. First, note-taking lets you capture any thoughts you have during the usability study. For example, you can indicate what you notice about each participant's body language or the way that they're talking. Are they smiling? Do they seem frustrated? These are all useful observations to put into your notes. Remember to keep what we just learned about biases in mind whenever you make assumptions on how a participant is feeling based on body language or tone of voice. One way to avoid this bias in a moderated study is to ask the participant how they felt at the point in the study where they appeared to show an emotion. Think back to the mock usability study from earlier. When conducting a usability study live or watching the recordings, you can take notes on the tone of the participant's voice or even their word choice when describing the tasks. Let's review how participant A completed a task in the example usability study. Prompt three, confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. Got it, okay. I'm going to click book right here. This seems fairly simple. What the heck? It looks like this is a page with details about my booking and the total cost. The app didn't even give me a page to confirm the dog walker I selected or the date and time I need. I'm not even sure if I had all the right details, but it went right to confirming the appointment. That's so annoying. I feel like most apps let you review what you're booking before you actually finish paying. Now let's review how participant D completed the same task. Prompt three. Confirm booking a dog walker and complete the checkout process. Hmm. Is booking the same thing as completing the checkout process? Is there a cart or something? Let me go back. Maybe I missed an add to cart button. I'd expect to see an add to cart or something here. I'm not sure on this one. Okay, let me go to the learn more page that was on earlier. This must be somewhere. Okay, so it looks like I'm back here again. My only option seems to be click on the book button, so I'll try it. Oh wow, seems like that worked. Although I really don't know what happened. The screen says congrats on total cost, but I don't really know what I booked or clicked. Like there was no confirmation page to tell me about the dog walker, the time or price I was scheduling. How strange. I don't think I ever had this happen before. Hmm. What do you notice about the word choice these participants used? Did you catch that their words made it sound like the task was not easy? If you can hear their voices, you may have noticed that their tones were very different from one another. Participant A sounded frustrated, but participant D spoke in a positive tone. Even when they found the task difficult, they still remained upbeat. This is why note-taking is so important during usability studies. It helps you capture thoughts that the participants may or may not verbalize. Second, you might take notes to summarize a participant's experience during the study. Let's review how participant C felt about the whole experience. Prompt five, would you use the dog walking app? Yeah, I definitely use this for sure. It really seems super simple to use. I just love to see a little more customization and of course, some more actual details of the content. After that, I think it's pretty much ready to go. Thanks for letting me try it out today. For example, you may write, Participant C felt the app was simple to use and would love to see more customization. Third, your notes can highlight really compelling quotes to include in your research report. Let's review how Participant D completed a task in the example usability study. Prompt three, follow-up. Did you find these tasks easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? Considering I had to go back and forth between screens of the app, that was not simple. Usually, with any sort of checkout process, there's an add to cart function. I was just clicking on different buttons to try to figure it out. For example, you may write something like this. Considering I had to go back and forth, yeah, that was not simple. Usually, with any sort of checkout process, there's an add to cart function. Now that you know why notes are important, let's discuss who takes them. As an entry-level UX designer, you won't run a usability study on your own or be expected to take all the notes. If you have a UX researcher on your team, they will likely run the study and take the notes. 
Even if there is a dedicated researcher for the study, it's helpful for other team members involved in the project to attend and take notes. Why? Because each team member is most likely to notice issues that impact their work. For example, a UX writer might notice that a participant pressed the wrong button on the app because the wording was confusing. On the other hand, a UX designer might notice how long it took a user to find a button. At Google, we take thorough notes. In fact, whether the study is conducted remotely or in person, many team members will observe the study. Once the study is over, everyone consolidates their notes and experiences. Then all these notes are distilled into key insights, which inform the designs in the next stage of the design process. Now that you've learned why you take notes, you'll learn how to take notes. There's no right way to do it, and everyone has a favorite note-taking method. Our usability study notes were messy on one sheet of paper. You might also put each observation on a sticky note so your notes are easier to organize later. If you want to be even more organized, you can use a method called spreadsheet note-taking, which we'll cover in the next video. See you there. Hey there. Let's continue our conversation about taking notes during usability studies. The notes you take will help you understand the user's point of view and first-hand experience. A simple and easy method to keep your notes organized is called spreadsheet note-taking. You can use this spreadsheet to take notes about the entire usability study in one place. So what is spreadsheet note-taking, and how can it keep your notes organized during a usability study? Let's investigate. Start by setting up the structure of your spreadsheet. Each participant from the usability study is listed in their own column across the top of the spreadsheet, starting in column B. Each row of the spreadsheet contains a behavior or observation in column A. Before the study begins, the team can fill out this observation column with a list of anticipated participant behaviors. For example, selects a date and time to schedule a dog walker, which is based on the first question we're asking participants. On the other hand, the team can start the study with an empty observation column and add to the list in real time when behaviors are observed. Even if you choose to start with a list of observations, it's okay to add additional ones during the study. If the team chooses to fill out the observation column in advance, it's helpful to organize it by categories. You can even add color or borders to separate each category. When taking notes, you will match each participant to a corresponding observation. You'll enter a 1 in the cell if the observation is true for that participant. You'll leave the cell blank if it is false. OK, now let's try to take some notes together. We'll rewatch part of participant B's recording and take notes as we go. First, let's make sure our note-taking spreadsheet is set up correctly. Looks like we have five participants across the top in the first row. Great. Now let's check the observations column. Our research team decided to fill it out before the study begins. It looks like they even organized the observations into three categories. Observations about how easy or difficult it was for the participants to complete the assigned task, observations about participants' opinions on the product's usefulness, and observations about the participants' tone of voice or attitude while completing the tasks in the study. They also left some extra rows where we can add additional observations. Now we're ready to take some notes. Let's start participant B's recording. Prompt one, pick a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Note. The product is only an example, so you will not be able to change the date or time on the screen. OK, so to pick a dog walker, I don't really know if dog walkers near you is how to schedule or if this schedule rectangle thing is the way to go. I'm a bit confused. I'll try the schedule thing. OK, cool. It seems like that worked because the app went to the next screen. I'm going to assume if this was clickable, I'd see a calendar at this point. Or it looks like maybe these two rectangles are both boxes that I would type a date and time into. Interesting. One thing I'm thinking about for myself and my own dogs is that it doesn't seem like there's a way to schedule a reoccurring dog walker. Like if I want someone to come walk the dog every week at the same time. This scheduling page seems like it's only a one-time appointment for this one date and one time. Anyway. I'll go ahead and click the submit thing, which I think is a button. Prompt one follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would 
change about the process of scheduling a dog walker. I mean, it was a bit hard to figure out which button to press on the home screen, but that's okay. That could be fixed, but I still figured it out. Also, I think there needs to be a way to do a reoccurring booking. Almost everyone I know with a dog doesn't schedule individual appointments like this. They want someone to walk their dog at the same time or on the same day every week or something like that. Let's pause here. Participant B just completed the first task, which tells us whether or not they can select a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Participant B said, I'm going to assume if this was clickable, I'd see a calendar at this point. Okay, done. Based on this, I'm going to put a one in cell C2 to show that participant B was able to select a date and time to schedule a dog walker. Participant B also said, I don't really know if dog walkers near you is how to schedule or if this schedule a walk thing is the way to go. I'm a bit confused. So I'm also going to add a one in cell C3 because participant B was confused by how to get to the screen to select a date and time to schedule a dog walker. This is an important part of the user flow. Let's start the recording again and make more notes about our observations. Prop two, select a dog walker. Okay, so it looks like there's a lot of options here and I can scroll through even more dog walkers. Any of these work for me. So I'm going to click one of these rectangles that say learn more. Looks like I'm in the right place. Cool. This seems like more details about a dog walker named Jane Doe. Prompt three, confirm booking of dog walker and complete the checkout process. Got it, okay. I'm going to click book right here. This one seems obvious since it's big at the top of the screen. Oh, that was super easy. Looks like I'm all set. I have this congratulations page, which I guess means my booking of a dog walker is all good. Prop three follow-up. Did you find this task easy or difficult to complete? Is there anything you would change? Wouldn't really change anything. That was pretty easy. I got it done quickly. Okay, what did you observe? Was participant B able to choose a dog walker from the list? You might have noticed when participant B said, any of these work for me, so I'm just going to click one of these rectangles that said learn more. I'd say they were able to select a dog walker, so I'm going to put a one in cell C4. Next, was participant B able to complete the checkout process? Participant B said, oh, that was super easy. Looks like I'm all set on that one. So I'll put a one in cell C6. Let's revisit the recording and keep building our notes. Prop four. From the home page, figure out where you would go to edit your address. Got it. Well, let me see if I can go back here. I think I need to press this X to get out of this screen. Ah, yes, I'm back on the home screen of the app. Cool. So if I'm looking for a place to edit my address, it's probably here under the logo for a person. Usually, in other apps, there's a profile page with all of your personal details like address, so I wonder if this app will be the same. Great, yes, found it. It says address right here. Okay, was participant B able to find the user profile to edit their address? Participant B said, cool, so it's probably here under the logo for a person. Great, found it. Participant B was able to easily find the user profile screen. So I'll put a one in cell C8. Back to the video one more time where we're going to look for some clues about participant B's tone of voice. Roll the tapes. Prompt five. Will you use the dog walking app? Uh, I don't know if that's useful, especially since you can't book a reoccurring time. Like I don't really know if I would just book a dog walker one day at a time. Seems like a lot of effort. To be honest, I don't think I'd really use it the way it's currently set up but thanks for letting me try it out. What did you notice about how participant B answered this question? One thing they said was, I don't know if it's that useful, especially since you can't book a recurring time. So I'll add a one in cell C11. 
there's one important part of the spreadsheet that we need to fill in. What did you notice about participant B's tone of voice and attitude? Which cell do we want to add a one to in this section? I observed that participant B sounded indifferent, so I'm going to put a one in cell C13. Hopefully you're getting a feel for how to take notes in a spreadsheet. You're off to a great start. After the study's completed and you've added all of your notes to the spreadsheet, it will be easy to identify the most common participant behaviors and the tasks participants found easy or difficult. And there you have it. You know how to use spreadsheet note-taking during a usability study. Now it's your turn to practice this skill during your next activity. Good luck. Hi, I'm Chikizi. I'm a UX lead for AR experiences at Google. We design AR experiences for Google search, for shopping, and other third-party brands. My favorite part about the job that I have right now is that I get to, one, work with amazing people, uh, super talented. A lot of them have a ton of experience, not only in the gaming industry and also filming. Uh, so there's so many different diverse backgrounds that uh, bring these experiences together, and it's a really it's really a joy to work with them. Two years ago, I started along with another uh, person at Google, um, a program called Champions Initiative. What it really was is uh, bringing design workshops to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. It was really um, going after the problem that the entire tech industry has of the lack of diversity. So we're really focused and uh, motivated uh, by bringing design education uh, to people that look like me. It's really important to have diverse voices and design. Um, when we think about what the purpose of design is, it's really to solve problems uh, and to drive a business forward. A business can't thrive and succeed if it's only going after one demographic or if it doesn't understand the problems of everybody that could be using their product. When we think about what businesses and what teams have been successful, it's the ability to separate themselves and to think about uh, different problems that they might not have experienced in their own life or things that uh, are new to them. There's just so many different applications that uh, diversity brings uh, to the team. Um, and that's just in terms of the product that you're making. And when we're talking about the team, um, I've seen, I've been on so many different teams, not only at Google, but also uh, outside of Google. and the teams that are most diverse are generally the most fun. Let's check in on the progress you're making. So far, we've gone through the first two steps in a UX research study. Plan the study and conduct the research. To conduct the research, we started with the basics. We covered what a usability study is and the differences between a moderated and unmoderated usability study. Next, you learned how to moderate a usability study. You even watched an example of an unmoderated usability study with five participants. You also gained an understanding of the biases that might come into play during a usability study and how to reduce that bias. Finally, you discovered how to take notes while observing participants in a usability study. Now it's time to move to step three of a UX research study. Analyze and synthesize the results. See you there. Welcome back. We're making our way through the four steps in a UX research study. So far, we've covered the first two steps, plan the study and conduct the research. As part of conducting the research, you watched an example of an unmoderated usability study, and you learned how to take notes while observing participants. After the usability study, we have a ton of feedback from participants. What are we going to do with it? Well, it's time to move to step three of a UX research study, analyze and synthesize the results. That's what this set of videos is all about. We'll learn how to synthesize the feedback and data you gathered during your usability study. When you synthesize something, you combine ideas to draw conclusions. What does that mean for us? Well, when UX designers synthesize research, we group data into themes. We want to find insights that evolve our understanding of users and their needs. That last part is really key. A synthesis evolves our understanding. For example, remember how four of the five participants in our usability study said they want to be able to book a dog walker repeatedly. By grouping these shared frustrations, we can understand how crucial this problem is and figure out ways to solve it. This is our insight. After we discover insights, we're ready to iterate on our design. Iterate means we revise the original design to create a new and improved version. 
UX design is all about coming up with an idea, getting feedback from participants or users, and iterating to make the idea better. We are constantly improving our work. So let's jump right into this exciting next step, analyzing and synthesizing the research results. To get started, we'll discuss a real-world example of how insights were used to improve a design here at Google. Although conducting research in a conference room is a valuable way to test designs with potential users, sometimes teams at Google need a more hands-on method for interviewing users and conducting usability tests. In this video, I'll tell you the story of how the Google Maps team expanded its understanding of how people get around in countries like India and Indonesia. Their first-hand learnings changed the design of Google Maps. In large, densely populated cities like Delhi, India, and Jakarta, Indonesia, traffic is a real headache. In a car, someone might be stuck in traffic for several hours per day. So, locals have found a way around this obstacle, two-wheel vehicles like scooters and motorcycles. They can weave around traffic and take shortcuts a car can't. The problem? Mapping applications like Google Maps were built for cars. Although cars and scooters drive the same roads, the drivers don't have the same ability to use Google Maps. For example, someone driving a car can listen and see directions as they drive. Although this is still possible for someone driving a scooter or motorcycle, it's much more difficult. They're likely wearing a helmet which covers their ears. The road noise is louder and harder to block out. And even having visible access to a mobile device while driving a scooter or motorcycle is complicated. A few years ago, a team of UX designers, researchers, engineers, product managers, and marketers from around the world traveled to the region to meet with locals. They interacted with locals in traffic, in their homes, and even on the backs of their motorcycles. The team valued the immersive experience of actually riding through traffic and experiencing the bugs in the Google Maps app in real time. So what insights did the team learn from their research? First, the team discovered that it is difficult to follow a map while driving a motorcycle. So many drivers memorize their routes beforehand. This insight was valuable in the design stage. It helped UX designers make the trip instructions more glanceable and memorable. Researchers also realized that pointing out landmarks during the trip is especially important for drivers of two-wheeled vehicles. The team took this insight and added more landmark references to the directions in Google Maps. Another research insight the team applied to the app was the addition of more language options. India alone has 22 official languages and thousands of local dialects. Indonesians speak hundreds of languages as well. Giving drivers more language options means they're more likely to understand the map's directions. Finally, another way that researchers applied their insights to the app experience was by customizing the directions themselves. Before, drivers of two-wheeled vehicles would be frustrated when they were expected to drive roads that were inaccessible to them because the terrain was too rough or the speeds weren't safe. In addition, driving a two-wheeled vehicle lets you take shortcuts through narrow alleys and roads that a car can't travel through. Now, users can switch Google Maps to two-wheeler mode, which changes the route that Google Maps recommends. This benefits users because it reduces time spent in traffic and provides them a more accurate, estimated arrival time. Traditional research, like asking riders to test a new app feature, collecting feedback, and compiling data, is always a useful process in the UX world. However, field research, or first-hand observation of people in their natural environment, is incredibly valuable, too. It allows researchers to collect audio, video, and in-person experiences. These personal experiences help the UX team truly empathize with its users and understand exactly what each person needs. Pretty great, right? Not every app or feature update requires this kind of hands-on research, but recognizing when your team would benefit from an authentic experience is a great skill to hone while you're building your knowledge of the research and design process. Pretty soon, You'll be taking on all the research and insights you've collected and iterating on your own designs. When you do, keep the story of the Google Maps team in mind. It might just inspire you to empathize with your users in a new way. OK, you've carefully planned your UX research study and conducted the research with participants. You're ready to turn your observations from the research into actionable insights. In this video, you'll learn what this process looks like in practice. First, let's review what an insight is in the field of UX design. You might remember that an insight is an observation about people that helps you understand the user or their needs from a new perspective. 
Insights can help us figure out how different pieces of data relate to each other. Insights also help explain what data means and what to do with it. So how can we come up with a list of insights? I'm glad you asked. In just four steps, we can turn the observations from our research into actionable insights. First, we need to gather all of the data from our usability study in one place. We might have collected data in various formats, such as stacks of sticky notes, a spreadsheet, audio notes, or even a notebook with our scribbles. You also need to gather together the notes from everyone who observed the usability study. Great. Step two, organize the data. This is where we take the data gathered in step one and arrange it. If you wrote your observations on sticky notes, you might use a method called affinity diagramming to organize your data. You'll learn more about this later. If you used spreadsheet note taking to record your observations, you've already started organizing the data without even realizing it. Step three, find themes in the data. One of the key goals of user research is to identify themes that are common across participants. These themes help us to turn our data into insights about the users. You'll find that UX designers and researchers often use the words, patterns, and themes interchangeably. Technically, they're a little different, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to use the word theme. Finally, come up with insights for each theme. We want to write an insight that tells the design team how to improve the product based on a theme. Depending on the amount of data you've collected, you should be able to come up with a handful of themes and insights. And that's it. You're starting to get the hang of how to turn observations from your usability study into insights. You're well on your way toward what we call synthesis, which is combining ideas to draw conclusions. In the following videos and activities, we'll go into each of these steps in more detail. In the next video, we'll dig into the first two steps, gather the data in one place and organize the data. Let's dig into the first two steps to turn observations into insights. As a reminder, the first step is to gather all of the data from our research in one place. Let's say you and your teammates took all of your notes during the usability study on sticky notes. You now need to gather everyone's sticky notes in one place. Then it's time to organize the data so that it's easier to interpret or understand. One method you can use to organize data is called affinity diagramming which is what we'll discuss in this video. Let's jump right in. An affinity is a feeling of like-mindedness or compatibility towards something or someone. Have you ever run into someone from your hometown while traveling? You likely felt an affinity towards them. You had something important in common that made you feel closer to each other. An affinity diagram is a method of synthesizing that organizes data into groups with common themes or relationships. Affinity diagramming is a quick and easy way to gather observations during a usability study and synthesize data. To make an affinity diagram, you need all of the observations from participants to be on sticky notes. So if you used spreadsheet note taking or took notes on a single piece of paper, you need to transfer all of the observations from participants onto sticky notes. You can skip this step if you took notes during the usability study on sticky notes in the first place. Each participant observation should be on its own sticky note. After all the interviews, you'll have a whole stack of sticky notes, each with one observation. Now it's time to organize. For people who love organizing, this activity can be really fun. As you review the sticky notes, start to make four or five clusters. You can place these clusters on a wall, window, or whiteboard. Your job is to bundle together sticky notes that have related ideas or themes. In order to do this, compare sticky notes one by one and ask yourself, is the observation on this sticky note similar to any of the other observations I've reviewed so far? Or is this observation different? Imagine you're organizing the books on your bookshelf by topic. Start by grabbing three books on the shelf. Next, look at each one to see what genre it is. Let's say you picked two mystery books and a romance novel. You now have two clusters, mystery books and romance novels. When you grab the next book, a cookbook, you'll decide if it goes into one of the clusters you already have or if you need to start a new cluster. Let's go back to our example usability study. You might pick up a sticky note that says, issues selecting a dog walker from the list. Another sticky note might say, can't find the button to select a dog walker. Even though these are different observations, they are related because they're both about selecting a dog walker from the list of available options. In other words, the participants got confused in the same place so you should cluster those notes together. 
you'll continue this process until you have gone through all of your sticky notes. As you wrap up, take a step back and look through the clusters again. Perhaps you'll want to move a few sticky notes from one cluster to another. Keep in mind that there will always be a few sticky notes left over at the end that don't relate to other ideas. You can put them aside if they don't relate to any clusters. So what makes affinity diagramming useful for synthesizing data? By putting sticky notes in clusters, you can easily spot themes across all of the observations from your usability study. It's also easy to shift ideas around between themes because you can peel and stick the notes in different locations. One more note about affinity diagramming. Although it's highly visual in nature, affinity diagramming can be adapted for participants who are visually impaired. For instance, during an affinity diagramming session, a participant with a visual impairment could dictate what to write on each sticky note. After stickies are grouped together, someone could read each sticky note out loud and ask participants to suggest groupings. This way, you keep all participants involved. We just learned a lot about affinity diagramming. Hopefully now you're feeling a little more confident about how to gather all of the data from your research in one place and organize that data so it's easy to understand. You also got a sneak peek into the next step, find themes. Coming up, we'll talk more about how to find themes in the data. Let's keep going. Welcome back. You've now learned how to gather all of the data from your research in one place and organize that data so it's easy to understand. Now it's time to find themes in that data. To do this, we'll ask ourselves two key questions. What common patterns stand out in the data you collected? And what do they tell you about your product design? Let's revisit our example usability study. To do this, let's open up the spreadsheet we used to take notes. What common patterns stand out in the data you collected? Look for rows where there are a lot of ones, which might indicate a pattern. You'll notice that some of the rows have four or five ones, so a majority of the participants responded similarly. We should explore these rows further. For example, row two is selects a date and time to schedule a dog walker. This row has five ones for participants A, B, C, D, and E. Next, row 10 is thinks dog walking app is useful and has four ones for participants A, C, D, and E. Let's jump down to another part of the spreadsheet, the observations we noticed while reviewing the participant recordings. Looks like row 17 wants to be able to book dog walker repeatedly, has four ones for participants A, B, C, and E. And just below that, row 18, surprised there's no confirmation page before completing checkout, has four ones for participants A, C, D, and E. On the flip side, you might also notice rows where there are a lot of blank cells. These rows also might indicate a pattern. For example, row 20 wishes they could filter dog walkers by experience level, has four blanks. Only participant E has a one in this row. All of these are common patterns that stand out in our data. So how do we turn this information into themes? We need to think about what these patterns tell us about the product design. We start by taking the observation, which is in column A, and then expand on it. For example, the observation for row 10 is, thinks dog walking app is useful. So our theme might be, most participants saw a use for the dog walking app. Let's try another one. The observation in row 17 is, wants to be able to book dog walker repeatedly. So our theme might be, most participants want to book a dog walker on a regular basis. How about one more? The observation in row 18, surprised there's no confirmation page before completing checkout. So our theme for this one would be, almost all participants were surprised there was no confirmation page before the checkout was completed. Thanks to our data being so organized in a spreadsheet, we can quickly identify themes by looking for ones and blanks. This is one of the great benefits of spreadsheet note-taking. Finding themes is a little trickier when using sticky notes and affinity diagramming. Your data is less organized, so you have to read and sort each observation individually to create the clusters that will become your themes. All right, so now you know how to find themes in data. Next, you'll learn how to come up with insights. You've now learned how to gather all of the data from your research in one place, organize that data so it's easy to understand, and find themes in the data. There's only one step left, come up with insights. 
As you come up with your own insights, you might be wondering, what makes an insight strong? In this video, we'll check out five qualities of strong insights. First, strong insights are grounded in real data. Insights need to be based solely on what you observed during the research study, not what you felt at the time. And each insight should be supported by multiple pieces of data. Insights are strongest when they apply to multiple study participants, instead of just one. It's okay to have outliers, of course. Not everyone will agree. But the more of your participants that feel the same way, the stronger your insight is. In our example usability study, four of the five participants want to be able to book a dog walker repeatedly. So we would write an insight based on the theme, most participants want to book a dog walker on a regular basis. Our insight might be, users want to book a dog walker on a scheduled basis instead of making a one-time reservation. Second, strong insights need to answer the research questions you listed in your research plan. You want to tie your insight to the research questions to help people understand why the insight matters. In our example usability study, the research questions were, how long does it take a user to find and book a dog walker in the app? And what can we learn from the user flow or the steps that users take to book a dog walker? So we'll need to come up with insights that answer either or both of these questions. Third, strong insights should be easy to understand. Keep in mind that your stakeholders might not have been involved in the planning of your study, but you still want them to understand your insights. Use simple language that doesn't require detailed knowledge of the study. If you randomly shared your insight with a friend, they should understand what you mean. For example, an insight for our usability might be, when users have to select a date, they prefer to see a calendar. This insight tells the team that users find it easier to pick a date in a calendar format instead of a list. The language used in this insight is easy to understand, even if you didn't know the details of the study. Fourth. Strong insights increase empathy for the user experience. Empathy increases the team's engagement because they put themselves in the user's shoes. That extra level of commitment can fuel their enthusiasm to improve the product. We can all imagine a time when we didn't know that we were going to be charged for a purchase. So another insight we might come up with is, users are surprised when there is not a confirmation page before being charged. You may have used another website or app where you selected an option thinking you'd have an opportunity to modify or cancel it, but instead the purchase was complete. This experience may have left you frustrated. This shared feeling allows you to empathize with the participants. Finally, strong insights inspire direct action. For example, an insight that states the dog walker app is useful does not suggest an action, but an insight that states users want to book a dog walker on a scheduled basis instead of making a one-time reservation tells the team that this part of the user experience needs to be adjusted. Remember, UX research is all about identifying problems, finding solutions, and testing those solutions. The most valuable insights include suggestions for putting a solution into action. Great, now you know all about research insights and how to come up with strong ones. Keep the tips we discussed in mind when you create insights, no matter what point in the design process you might be in. And that's it. You now know how to turn observations from your usability study into insights. Great job. My name is Utkarsh. I am a UX manager at Google. My role here at Google is to manage a team of people who specialize in the understanding of human behavior. Uh, we invest a lot of time and energy in understanding people's needs and behaviors and motivations. And uh, we use a lot of that information to in, inform how we build products. A designer can take a lot of key insights from usability studies and use them to inform the product and, and improve the product for the users we are designing for. When a designer and researcher are uh, partnering together and a designer is sitting there watching the usability study live, they can actually look at the user behavior firsthand and identify opportunities where um, oh, this person is not able to mm, find this particular button, which they have to now click to move forward. And that is the only way to move forward. And because a researcher is probing into why that uh, the issue is, a designer can then take that insight and start building around the problem, uh, a new solution which can help fix the problem. As UXers, one of the key things I tell people who are entering the field is 
fall in love with the problem and don't fall in love with the solution itself. So when you fall in love with the problem, then you can start identifying new and different and novel ways on solving that problem, uh, which you might not necessarily think of if you hone in on the solution which that particular participant gave you. Now that, that solution might work for that participant, but we are not designing for one person. We are designing for millions and billions of people. So we got to find a solution which works for a wide variety of people and not necessarily for a subset of people. So in the process of solution design, which comes after a study is complete, it is very important to really understand not only what the problem was, but also why the problem occurred in the first place. And once you fall in love with the understanding of the problem, then you are much more equipped to come up with solutions and find solutions which might not have been thought of in, in the first place. Now, you have defined a solution for the problem that existed in the small space, but how does that solution work and how does that solution scale to the rest of your experience is also an important part. And keeping the entire holistic experience end-to-end -end, um, in mind is very essential to uh, coming up with any solution uh, for problems which are being identified for the product. Congratulations. You've made it through the third step of the UX research study process, analyze and synthesize the results. You explored how to turn observed data into insights. You learned how to gather the data in one place, organize that data, find themes, and come up with strong insights. You also learned a new method to gather and organize your data called affinity diagramming. And you even heard a story about how Google Maps used research insights to improve their product. Knowing how to turn your observations into insights and how to spot strong insights are essential skills to have as you start your career in UX design. Coming up, it's on to the final step of the UX research study process, where you'll share and promote your insights. Let's do it. Congratulations. You've made it to the fourth and final step in a UX research study. So far, you've learned how to plan the study, conduct the research, and analyze and synthesize the results. Now it's finally time to let your hard work shine in the spotlight. You're ready to share and promote the insights and iterate on your low fidelity designs. As a reminder, research insights are observations about people that help you understand the user or their needs from new perspectives. Keep in mind what you learned earlier about how to write strong insights. Your insights should be grounded in real data, answer the research questions, be easy to understand, increase empathy for the user's experience, and inspire direct action. Coming up, you'll explore two popular formats for sharing your insights, a presentation and a research report. You'll also learn how to create a strong presentation and deliver that presentation with ease. Then you'll modify your low fidelity wireframes based on insights from your research. So let's get going with the final step in a UX research study, sharing and promoting the insights. We're in the final step in a UX research study where you get to share and promote the insights from your research. You might be wondering, how do I share my research insights with stakeholders? That's exactly what we'll cover in this video, which is about two different formats you can use to share your insights. So let's get to it. One of the most common formats that UX researchers and designers use to share their work is presentations. A presentation is a group of slides where each slide has new information. Presentations provide your stakeholders with a high-level overview of the project. For example, your presentation might only share the top three to five insights from your usability study to keep stakeholders engaged. Presentations can be used to share your insights with a big group of people, and that group of people might include stakeholders who are not in the field of UX. Presentations can be made pretty quickly using tools like Google Slides, Microsoft PowerPoint, or Apple's Keynote. Keep in mind, people might use the term deck instead of presentation, but the two words mean the same thing. Here's an example of how a UX research presentation might be built. The presentation consists of 15 to 20 slides broken up into four sections, study details, themes, insights and recommendations, and an appendix. Another format you can use to share your research insights is a research report. A research report is a document with fewer visuals containing the same information as the presentation. A research report can be made using tools like Google Docs, Microsoft Word, or Apple's Pages. Research reports will often place the summary of the research insights and recommendations before the detailed insights. This allows stakeholders to quickly read the actionable information. And there you have it. You now know two common formats to share your research insights.
presentations, and research reports. I bet you're excited to create your own. Next up, we'll go through how to create a strong presentation. Welcome back. We just discussed two popular formats to share your research insights, presentations and research reports. Now we're going to dig into one of those formats, presentations, and learn how to present insights in an engaging way. Let's start by opening up the presentation template. On the first slide, I'm going to update the title, date, and team. I'll title the presentation Dog Walking App Usability Study. The title can be simple and straightforward. I'll also add the date of the presentation. In this case, it's December 2020, and I'll fill in the names of all of my team members who worked on the usability study with me. Now I'll move to the next slide, which is the table of contents. This is an easy one. This slide already has the right names for sections of the presentation, so there's no need for me to make any updates. Up next, we've made it to the study details section. Notice that each section in the presentation has a title slide like this that has a different color background, limited text, and large font. I'm going to open up my research plan so I can refer back to it as I fill out the details in this section. All right, now that I've got my research plan pulled up, let's take a look at the first slide in this section, the project background. The project background explains what led you to conduct this research, including why the insights were needed and what impact they will have on decisions being made. For our project background, I'll write, we're creating a new app to help people find and schedule dog walkers. We need to find out if the main user experience, finding and scheduling a dog walker, is easy for users to complete. Next up, study details. I'm going to refer to my research plan again to complete this slide quickly. I'll start by updating the first column with our two research questions. How long does it take a user to find and book a dog walker in the app? And what can we learn from the user flow or the steps that users take to book a dog walker? We only have two research questions, so I'm going to delete the optional headers. Next, I'll update the second column with the number of participants and a short overview of their characteristics. I'll put five participants and list their characteristics as two males, two females, and one non-binary individual between the ages of 20 to 60. Now I'll find the third column with the methodology. I'll list each participant's session as 10 minutes in length. For location, I'll write United States. Remote, because each participant went through the usability study in their own home. The format is an unmoderated usability study. Finally, I'll provide a high-level overview of the procedure. I'll type, users were asked to perform tasks in a low-fidelity prototype. Okay, on to the prototype or design mock. On this slide, we need to add a screenshot of the product or feature that we asked participants to provide feedback about. So I'm going to add a screenshot of our dog walking app prototype. All right, we've made it to the theme section. This is where we share some of the themes from the synthesis of our data. Each theme has its own slide. The theme is listed at the top as the header and evidence to support the theme is provided in bullets below. I'm going to put our first theme as the header which is, most participants want to book a dog walker on a regular basis. Next, I'll add some data as supporting evidence. For the first bullet, I'll type, four of the five participants want to be able to book a dog walker repeatedly. For the second bullet, I'll add, not all participants who wanted to book a dog walker on a regular basis express the same level of frustration. For this particular theme, I don't have a third point to add as evidence, so I'll delete one bullet. I can also remove the placeholder text in the first line. Then I'll add a quote from a participant that supports the theme. A quote helps bring the theme to life in the words of someone who's experiencing the product firsthand. I had taken notes about an important quote from participant A who said, I also would have liked a way to book a dog walker every Saturday morning. It seems like you can only book one appointment at a time for this. That's kind of annoying too. This quote, shows that participant A would book a dog walker regularly if given the opportunity. Finally, I'll add a screenshot of the low fidelity prototype that highlights the issues participants had with this task. In the real world, you would add more than one theme. This slide shows how we could add theme number two. For our example, I'll skip this, but hopefully you have a good feeling for how to fill this in. Okay, we've made it to the third section, which is a summary of our insights and recommendations. Let's fill out the first slide in this section, Research Insights. It's helpful to prioritize your research insights from the most urgent to the least urgent. You'll likely do this prioritization with project stakeholders like a fellow designer, the product manager, or an engineering lead. 
there are a few insights that should be considered a priority zero or P0, which means they must be fixed for your product to work. For example, were there any parts of the design that prevent the user from completing the main user flow? Imagine if users weren't able to book a dog walker in our dog walking app. That's definitely something we'd want to fix and would be considered a P0 issue. Or were there parts of your design where users felt tricked? This might indicate a deceptive pattern. Think about the participants in our dog walking app usability study who were frustrated or surprised that there wasn't a confirmation page before they were charged. Not including a confirmation page might seem like a sneaky way to take money from users, which is not our intent and is something we want to avoid. Finally, were there any parts of your design that were inequitable or inaccessible? Users of all abilities, identities, and experiences need to be able to successfully move through your product's design. These are P0s to address too. After you identify your P0 insights, you'll likely have a lot of insights left to take action on. These insights can be categorized into buckets based on their priority. In addition to priority zero, you might have buckets called priority one and priority two. Let's think about an example of an insight that might be categorized as priority one. During the usability study on the dog walking app, many participants said they wanted to be able to make a recurring appointment with a dog walker. Since participants shared this pain point, you could consider it as priority one or P1. One reason you might not consider it as a priority zero is that even without the recurring appointment feature, the user can still complete the main flow in the app. You could reason that the extra ability to make a recurring appointment with a dog walker would improve the user experience and therefore could be considered a P1 to include in a future prototype to be tested. If your team ends up with lots of priority one insights, you may choose to further categorize these insights by adding another bucket called priority two. For example, you and your team might review a list of 10 insights that you initially categorized as priority one and identify which of those insights to address this month, which would stay as priority one versus next month, which would become priority two. This additional ranking enables smaller teams to divide up the work and focus on the most important design changes first. I'll show you how to add in one insight as an example. Inside the circle, I'll type unable to make recurring booking. For the brief description, I'll add, in general, users want to book a dog walker on a scheduled basis instead of making a one-time reservation. When you create your presentation, you should fill out all of the circles here with each of your insights. You will often have three to five strong insights. So we have spaces for four insights in this template. Next. We need to provide some recommendations to our stakeholders. Recommendations are actions we think the stakeholders should take based on our study. For now, I'll just write one recommendation, but normally you would have at least three. Based on the insight we shared in the last slide, my recommendation would be make it possible to book a dog walker on a recurring basis. And that's a wrap. It's always nice to end with a thank you slide. It's also common to include an appendix after the end of the presentation. This is where you can add slides with extra data on topics your audience might have more detailed questions on. For example, a detailed list of participants and their characteristics. However, you would not show these slides or talk about them as part of your presentation. Wow, just like that, you have a presentation that showcases all of the hard work you put into a research study. It feels pretty good to see your insights come to life in a concrete way, doesn't it? One more thing, remember that you can share this same information in a document format instead of a presentation. If you wanna create a research report, the template document has the same sections and headers that we just walked through. So you can fill in the same information in the same way, just in a different format. Next up, we'll talk about how to deliver a presentation and let your insights shine. Hi there. Your research insights are now ready to share in a beautiful presentation format. The only thing left to do is deliver the presentation. Have you ever come across a video or speech that you just couldn't pull yourself away from? A good presentation can feel magnetic and you're hooked. You may feel like some people have this natural, almost magical ability to give engaging presentations. But believe it or not, presenting is not something that people are just suddenly good at. In fact, if you examine the content and the person's delivery closely, there are several things that great presenters do that you can start doing too. That's what we'll cover in this video. 
will focus on presentation skills so you can successfully deliver your own research insights. Before we jump in, let's address the elephant in the room. You might be scared of public speaking. That's completely normal. The best thing about presenting is that you can learn and practice. Even if you don't have any experience in public speaking, if you put in the time to practice, I know that you will succeed. Okay, so how can you become one of those magnetic, engaging, captivating presenters? First, be concise. Don't ramble into long stories or share unimportant details. Stick to the main points that you need the audience to remember. Second, keep your tone conversational, like you're chatting with a friend or colleague. You don't want to sound robotic or like you're reading from a script. Third, great presenters use stories to keep the audience engaged. Use relatable and specific examples to illustrate points. Think back to the story we shared about Google Maps improving the product for motorcycle and scooter drivers. Chances are that story stuck in your mind after you walked away from the video because it was engaging. Fourth, the best presenters master the art of the pause. When we're feeling nervous, we tend to want to fill pauses in conversation. You can probably think of a time when you've experienced awkward silence, but allowing natural pauses in conversation actually displays confidence. Give it a try next time you're having a conversation with a friend. Try leaving a little more of a pause. Notice how the pause sounds and feels before you respond. Finally, compelling presenters make eye contact. If possible, try to make individual eye contact with different people in the audience throughout your presentation. You make eye contact when speaking to your friend one-on-one, -on -one, so why not do it when you're speaking to a larger group? This might feel a little strange at first, but it'll come more naturally the more you do it. Okay, now you know how to deliver a stellar presentation and share your research insights with the world. Try using a couple of these tips next time you give a presentation. You'll get better and better each time you present. So start practicing. You're going to do great. Hey, I'm Heather. And I'm a UX research manager at Google. We really want to make sure that whatever research we have um, that we're doing actually can answer some questions that the engineers, the designers, the product managers have. For example, they want to know, is this product something that users are going to benefit from? Those are some of the questions we like to ask. When we do research, we can identify whether a product is something that people are going to use or going to want to use, are going to find useful, and also like to use, or whether maybe it's something that they won't end up using at all. When we acquire insights, we get a lot of good information and identify what are the important takeaways. When we identify what the goals are and what we want to learn, and then hopefully we've learned that through doing the research, we could just put a report together and you know put it in a nice document, make it easy to read, have all the highlights at the top. We find that you know ultimately people can read a document, but it does not come to life. And when we can actually tell the story of the research and what we were looking for and what we found and even little vignettes of some of the things that we found by talking to people and learning about their lives and their experiences, we can bring that to life. And then we can share that with the product managers, the engineers and designers and it will have a lot more impact. Those insights become alive. So therefore, a presentation is so important. In giving a presentation, there are a lot of things to think about. What do you want people to walk away with? What information do you want them to know? For example, you know, what are the three takeaways that you want them to understand about the product or whatever you're researching? I would ensure that those items are listed at the front, they're spoken about in the front, and they're also repeated at the end. Also, I would sprinkle in as much as possible stories, because if you hear any of the pros out there that talk about presentations, they always say tell stories, even if it's from your own life or from the research uh, studies that you've done, and the stories that you are coming up with uh, based on what you saw, what you observed, 
tell those stories. That will bring the information, the data to life. I think the third thing, maybe not as a hard science, but more of a soft science, I always recommend, you know, bring your own personality. Don't try to be anything different or be stiff or, you know, act a certain way. Just be yourself because people resonate and relate best to when you're just being who you are. And when the more comfortable you are, the more that people are going to hear you and connect with you. Hi again. Now you have a presentation or report filled with insights from your research. You've also shared those insights with stakeholders and agreed on the ones to take action on. The next step is to improve your designs based on what you've learned. That means using your research insights to revise your designs. So why do we do this? Conducting research, like a usability study, helps us identify the pain points that participants experience with different prototypes. Each time we learn about a pain point, there's an opportunity to update the design and make the experience better for users. That way, the issues can be fixed before the final product launches. Participants might have identified a lot of pain points during the usability study. As you might remember, to make the analysis easier, we found themes in the data and turned those themes into insights. So how do you know which insights to use to update your design? It's helpful to prioritize your research insights from the most urgent to the least urgent. You'll likely do this prioritization with project stakeholders like a fellow designer, the product manager, or an engineering lead. There are a few insights that should be considered a priority zero or P0, which means they must be fixed for your product to work. For example, were there any parts of the design that prevented the user from completing the main user flow? Or were there parts of your design where users felt tricked? This might indicate a deceptive pattern. Finally, were there any parts of your design that were inequitable or inaccessible? Users of all abilities, identities, and experiences need to be able to successfully move through your product's design. These are P0s to address too. After you identify your P0 insights, you'll likely have a lot of insights left to take action on. These insights can be categorized into buckets based on their priority. In addition to priority zero, you might have buckets called Priority 1 and Priority 2. This additional ranking enables smaller teams to divide up the work and focus on the most important design changes first. All right, so you've prioritized the pain points that were highlighted by participants during your research. You might still have questions. Keep in mind that the findings from our small usability study were limited since we were only able to get perspectives from five participants. In the real world, many UX researchers want to have five to eight participants. As you learned in an earlier reading, the reason studies are often capped at eight participants is that research shows there's often diminishing return on investment if additional participants are added to the study. Your ability to do more research will depend on your team, your company, your project timeline, and your project budget. Like we've discussed before, UX design is a really iterative process. Very often, prioritizing and advocating for user needs becomes the responsibility of the UX researcher and designer. This is especially important when it comes to better understanding the needs of groups that have been historically underrepresented in user studies. We'll create prototypes, learn from research, and iterate on our designs many times. And it's important that we make the efforts to reach out to user groups whose experiences and needs are often not considered in design. This entire process of researching, synthesizing, and then iterating based on that research is a loop, not a line. That means the cycle is often repeated many times. For the purposes of this course, we've been taking you through a more linear process. But in reality, the design process rarely plays out like that. Next up, let's get back to our project in Figma. We'll modify our low fidelity designs based on insights from a usability study. See you there. We just discussed how you'd prioritize the insights from a usability study, which determines how to iterate on your low fidelity designs. Now it's time to actually make changes to your designs in Figma based on those insights. First, let me clarify something that's a little tricky. We're going to make changes to our wireframes at this stage, not our low fidelity prototype. Why? Well, think of an author writing a book. The writer doesn't update the binding of the book each time they edit a few words. 
Instead, the writer edits the words on the page, and once all the edits are complete, the pages are renumbered and bound into a book. It's similar for designers. Wireframes are turned into a low-fidelity prototype through connections. In the same way, pages are turned into a book through binding. All right, so let's jump into Figma and make changes to our wireframes. While you were away, I had a few discussions with stakeholders about our research insights, and we aligned on three changes to make to the Dog Walker app wireframes. As a reminder, here are the low fidelity designs for our Dog Walker app before the usability study. There are three insights from our research that we'll focus on as I iterate on the wireframes. First, I'll make it possible to book a Dog Walker on a recurring basis. Then I'll make it easier to pick a date when scheduling a Dog Walker. And third, I'll add a confirmation page before the book a Dog Walker page. Let's start with insight number one. Make it possible to schedule a dog walker on a recurring basis. Almost every participant in the study said that they wanted the option to book a dog walker on a scheduled or recurring basis. To make it possible for users to do this, I've added a checkbox below the date and time boxes labeled recurring booking. If the user checks the box, their booking will repeat on the same day and at the same time every week. Next, let's examine the second insight we want to address from our research. Participants in the usability study said they'd like an easier way to choose dates when scheduling a dog walker. In the first iteration of the wireframe, which I've pulled up here on the left, users needed to specify the exact day and time in an open text box. For example, they would have to type in May 2nd. Based on the participant feedback, we decided to iterate on the design and include a list of dates and times users can scroll through. We also added the ability for users to indicate how long they want the walk to be. You can check out this new iteration on the right side of the screen. Finally, let's think about the third insight that will inform how we iterate on our designs. We learned from users that they wanted a confirmation page before booking the dog walker. To fix this, I need to add a new confirmation page to our wireframes. This will be an additional screen that doesn't currently exist. Notice that I went ahead and created a new screen for our wireframes called Confirm Booking. This page is displayed before users complete the checkout process. Now users will have an additional page before booking, just like our study participants requested. Wonderful. We've now iterated on our wireframes based on insights that were uncovered during our usability study. If I needed to conduct more research or have a prototype to show stakeholders, my next step would be to reconnect the wires to turn the designs back into a low fidelity prototype. You did it. You've made it through all four steps of the UX research study process. Plan the study, where you learned about the seven elements of a research plan. Conduct the research, where you dug into usability studies. Synthesize the results, where you turned observations from your research into actionable insights, and share the research insights, where you learned how to create a presentation and deliver that presentation like a star. You also learned how to update your wireframes based on research insights. You should feel accomplished and proud of the progress you've made so far. We've covered a lot of ground, and you're almost done with the course. Now to finish strong. All right, that's it. You've reached the end of this course. Take a moment to celebrate this milestone. You should be proud. Let's recap everything we've explored together. In this course, you learned how to plan a research study and conduct research with a usability study. You even wrote and ran your own usability study for the first time. Next, you analyzed and synthesized your research results and turned them into actionable insights. Then you shared and promoted your research insights in a presentation. Finally, you learned how to modify your designs based on research insights. At this point, you have low fidelity designs that outline the function and structure of your app. In the next course, it's time to add color, cool fonts, fun icons, and even animations to your work. Your designs will start to look and feel like a real app. To get your designs across the finish line, you'll be guided by a new instructor, Kunal. Kunal has a unique background in architecture and is now an interaction designer here at Google. I'm confident you'll have a great time learning about high fidelity designs with him. Before you go, let me just say one more time, fantastic job. Thanks so much for taking this course. I hope you had as much fun as I did. 
When you're ready, you can go ahead and start the next course. Kunal will be there to lead the way.